What's up, guys? We got another rep files for you. And uh, we got JMG, Jeff from JMG Reptiles here. He's only out in outside of Cleveland, Ohio. And of course, we have our co host Dave from RL Exotics. And uh, we're just going to start talking. Jeff has a lot of stuff going on. So let's get into it. You need me to start, Chow Jr.? You want to just roll into something? Oh, I could say, yeah, uh, we said a lot of stuff going on. I mean, I'm moving into a new place currently, and uh, behind me, I got a bunch of my baby hognose snakes, and I, I know Dave's uh, just kind of recently moved into a newer facility as well, and um, it's been kind of, uh, luckily, I got a place that's only about five, ten minutes from my, um, you know, old place where I still have a lot of my animals, so it's pretty easy to transport everything back and forth. It's actually been a uh, pretty difficult but um luckily just being close i've uh that's actually alleviated a lot of the stress because i can just run back and forth constantly gotcha gotcha and when did you make the move mm, well it wasn't totally ready to move in when i got my place which was like in the late fall but i started transitioning and moving stuff over probably around december january all right and has anybody filmed in here yet no nobody has so this is us this is our first time this is, we're in this is good <laughs> We're the first time guys. It's a debut. Debut. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's not entirely done, but it's like, it's getting there. The only room that hasn't been finished is like my gecko room. That room's kind of still like, um, just painted and the floors need to be done. And one other thing needs to be installed and that's pretty much it. So it's pretty close. That's awesome. That's it's cool. still fun. We, you know, I think, I think it's uh, every reptile person's dream to always move up, move up and get things better and better. So it's exciting when we see other people doing it. It's it's great, almost living vicariously through you. <laughs> oh, thanks. Right. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of cool. It seems like a, a lot of people I noticed uh, lately, like my one, my friend John, who also breeds hognose snakes, he uh, built a facility and it's like crisp and clean, brand new, and he's right. just uh, started progressively moving to that spot also. And then like you know, I know Dave recently got a new place, and um, I've seen a few pictures of that. So it's pretty, yeah, it's real fun moving everything and actually having a lot more ample space and expand uh you know just space to expand and to you know just put everything where it needs to go gotcha yeah, gotcha that's where we're at right now we uh hopefully this year we'll be able to move into a dedicated facility but we're like busting at the seams here trying to cram stuff in corners so <laughs> yeah, yeah that's how everything seems to go right before you're you know ready to move up you know it's kind of like never goes exactly as planned but once you get the you know space or wherever you're moving into Mm -hmm. so uh what i guess i'd like to know start like what your history is in the hobby like how you got in and uh you know what you've gone through and how you got to where you are today and how long you've been doing it um well i think it's kind of like a lot of people they kind of had interest from the time they were a kid <laughs> and um you know being exposed to like you know either reptiles and amphibians which i was because my dad uh my dad bred red foot tortoises and a lot of a lot of frogs. He actually he brought like Argentine horn frogs, tomato frogs, uh, a few other species. Um, and then he also had some leopard geckos and fat tail geckos. And uh, uh, I kind of remember, you know, remember a lot of that stuff from the time I was like, you know, four or five years old, you know, real vaguely. And uh, he actually didn't keep their breed any snakes. And uh, when I see my first snake was uh, in our yard, I was probably like five with a garter snake and I was pretty enthralled with that. And I think it was because I had so much exposure and wasn't really exposed to snakes. So it wasn't really that big of an interest of my dad's at the time. And so when I seen a snake, I kind of really, you know, grasped onto those as far as having an interest in them. And, you know, I had like an old like Audubon that my dad had. So it was all like, you know, illustrations of uh, North American species. He has North American species of reptiles and amphibians. And there's an illustration of like an Eastern milk snake. And that's actually... Um, first like snake I kind of fell in love with, which was kind of funny because they live in Ohio. They have a pretty wide <laughs> right on. snakes. And, and so my first pet was when I was seven, I was an Eastern milk snake. And, uh, you know, then it kind of progressed from there. And actually at that time, my dad was phasing out of breeding stuff and he had, uh, you know, other interests and in what we were also moving houses to and everything. And the only thing he kept was his red foot tortoise collection. And, um, then I started wanting to get more snakes and, uh, I'd always be asking him to take me to reptile shows and stuff, which was sometimes a drag for him. Cause he's like, Oh, now I got to wake up, you know, on the weekends. And, you know, I wanted to go to every reptile show. And, and, uh, then I see my first hognose snake when I was like eight 
and it was like a wild caught female and just this mm-hmm. big plastic container i remember mm-hmm. and uh then i was like what kind of snake's that and my dad's like oh that's a you know hog and snake i've you know seen those before and everything and then from then on i just really wanted to get into hog nose and uh you know i started wanting to breed them and uh so i was getting more and more and at the time my dad was kind of like you know kind of like oh i don't want you getting too much stuff because you know i might have to help and i don't want to <laughs> get you know involved at all you know yeah. and then by the time i was like 12 i was wanting to breed leopard geckos and uh, then he kind of seen at that point you know i wasn't stopping my interest was only expanding and he was getting reinterested in it through the you know my interest in passion and he's like well you know i used to breed these and he's like and he's seeing me like kind of barter with people and everything and trying to spend like 50, 60 bucks on a leopard gecko. And a lot of them having like, you know, like a Murphy pattern list that was like a hundred dollars. And they're like, no, I'm not going to sell this to you for 50 or 60 bucks. And mm. then my dad's like, you want me to just, you know, buy some? And he goes, we could start breeding them together. And then, you know, as soon as he got involved with the leopard geckos and everything, we kind of just went full bore. And then he just re caught his passion for that. It seemed like pretty much instantaneously. And how old? How old? How old were you at that point? Uh, when we started getting rolling the leopard geckos, I was like 12, 13. 13, and by the time I was 15, <laughs> we were like pretty much had the whole basement converted to a bunch of built melamine racks. And I was still breeding some hog nose. I had some Kenyan sambos and stuff. And um, maybe had a few other species, but then we had like leopard and fat tail geckos. That's cool, man. It's awesome. Dave, I know you had a couple of questions. You're un- uh, definitely a little more quiet than normal. Well, I'm, just, I'm waiting for my time. I'm not going to try to push it, but um, well, honestly, um, I mean, one of my favorite things you always had was the Arctic Project, and that was something that you said you found when you were how old? Um, you were just- it wasn't really um, it wasn't really uh, at the time I didn't know. I knew it was something different, and that's kind of how I started. Like, uh, because I didn't have a lot of money then uh, when I was buying cognos snakes at all. You know, especially when I was in my mid well, my mid teens, I would save up like every dime I made in a year, any of, you know, uh, money I got from Christmas or just any, cause I'd work all summer for people and I'd save up and I usually so, well, I'd go to Daytona and other shows and I'd, you know, buy hog nose snakes. And I looked for anything that was odd. And, um, when I got the first Arctic, I think I was, I was young. I was probably a little under the age of 15. And at the time I didn't know that was the actual even animal that started the project until I bred it into my lemon uh, ghost uh, project, which was just kind of like a high bright, like like yellow colored uh, hog nose that had a predominantly yellow stomach. Um, mm-hmm. It kind of had like a hypo-ish look. And I picked that one out at a show and bred that into my uh, lemon ghost. And I had some uh, different looking babies as a few that kind of had some uh, highlights to them and everything. And it wasn't until I kind of outcrossed them from Lemon Ghost, you seen more of that, what a typical, you know, Arctic would look like, that kind of look. And uh, so it, it's been a long time. I mean, when I got I picked up the first Arctic, it was probably around like 17 years ago. Wow. So these guys don't know a whole lot about hog nose. So I told you beforehand, you got to have some hog nose in your hand. Uh, you want to get some super Arctic stuff while you're chatting? Yeah, yeah I'll grab, I'll grab, uh, and if you want to grab a single gene form to kind of show it, because again, when you see the single gene form compared to the super form, it's absolutely mind blowing what that animal does. Yeah, the single gene form is going to be kind of hard to show up on camera. Um, you know, as far as the key characteristics, and maybe not. I might have some pretty cool. I, yeah, I do. I definitely have some pretty, pretty cool Arctic. Let me grab one. Sure. Well, I'm kind of wondering. That's kind of entertaining. Maybe we'll just have a look. <laughs> just watch me look around and see which one's a good one. I mean, I got some. See, a lot of them are combinations, and this one's really cool. I'll bring this one over, even though it's a kind of an Arctic lavender. Make sure to bring this a super Arctic with you by itself um, so you can see the black and the white. If you I don't have one, it's super Arctic now because it will be, I don't want to have too many snakes in my hand. Well, let's start with like five or six. Don't be a little wussy about it. Yeah, this would be great. I don't want that many. <laughs> Just put some in your pockets and yeah, those are one of the big pockets you got there. I just pop them in there. Yeah, <laughs> you can Pee Wee Herman it, you know. Oh yeah, you can be a Pee Wee Herman. That guy. Huh? <laughs> yeah, like Dave told it to uh, today. Uh, well, it was actually a couple of days ago. He goes, "Yeah, you can put on like a goofy hat and stuff." And so, like, I was like, "Yeah, I'll get my one metallic hat." And uh, 
I do not have it. So Dave's the only one that's dressed crazy. <laughs> that's fine. I mean, people are used to it. This is an Arctic here. Um, the one that's kind of more normal colored. But you could – actually, this is kind of a bad example of an Arctic. To me, I can definitely tell. It's really easy one. I'm uh, camera's going to kind of toss. But this one has the more frosted, like, light-colored background. Mm -hmm. Okay. They have, like, a grayish background. Their saddles are – typically greenish um if you look real closely the one characteristic of arctics is like a lot of black concentration around the saddles and uh, i'm not sure if you can see that yeah i don't think we're getting any of that actually i think your camera's horrible now that we're really looking at your animals but you can send the b-roll and i'll i'll, I'll put yeah, in the b-roll yeah there's a super arctic here i don't know how well you can see that it's not even in the camera <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm trying to see i can't really see but i can kind of see you should probably take like your shirt and rub your camera a little bit. It looks like you got like a foggy spot on there, man. Like maybe you left a little um I don't know, um what do they call it? <laughs> uh, hand lotion on there, maybe? <laughs> yeah, sure. That could it be what they call fine. it. With the oh, right. Yeah, well, I hope. It should it should be a pretty good camera. I mean, his laptop's fairly I, new. <laughs> I'll be honest, I think it looks a lot better now. I think you were just carrying your computer around with your thumb over the camera. Yeah, I don't think it was. I think it's. I think it looks the same. Here, I'll grab more. I'll grab it, some. I think yeah. it looks. I think it looks more sharp. <laughs> yeah, I think it looks a lot more sharp. Yeah, considerably better. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you even look high different. You look like high definition far away now, man. We weren't getting the full effect. That's a super arctic lavender right there. So that's a combination of the recessive lavender lavender trait and the incomplete dominant super form super arctic right combination. That's a good looking animal. If you throw that the full screen, does it cut off the audio? No. Like our audio to talk? Yeah, that might uh, be better that way. Because I think you need to be a little further from the camera when you do this. Because I think when you get too close, it's not um, focusing right. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. So now let's start the whole process over again. Go get the rest of those animals. <laughs> <laughs> now it actually looks good. Get, um, yeah, I'm going to be really needy here. Get, get an, a super arctic with more high whites on it. I don't yeah, want to gray yeah, out. that one I grabbed was kind of like that's actually a half laughter, and that one's like bizarre looking. That's like not even really a typical looking super art thing, actually. Um, probably grab one from this rack because I got uh, I'm trying to find one that shed out already. This one's this shed. This is a dirty one. That was pretty cool, but it's dirty. Yeah, that's not what I wanted. I want I want clean <laughs> crisp. You want a really nice black and white one. Yeah, I want that black and white. If you got to run to the other room, we can get by without you. Okay, big screen this thing. Better be worth it. All right, hang on one second. Uh, okay, I think that's a better one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's nice. And you want to show the belly off of that guy? Yeah, it's like solid black. Although oh, this one wow. has some boarding. Most yeah. super you have like near a black belly. This one's got a little checker boarding. Oh, that's okay. awesome. That's cool. So, but um, yeah, that, so the cool thing about Junior's new place is his old place was about the size of this one room right here. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, I don't know if it's that small. Oh, it was freaking small, man. The uniformity of that pattern is awesome. Yeah, yeah, they, I, like it's. It changes it quite a bit. Um, it does a lot of stuff. This gene really alters a lot. For one, they have solid black eyes. So if you look real close, you'll oh, see yeah. you can't distinguish the iris from the pupil. Um, it increases the black, wherever black is on Western hognose, like under saddles, it's you know dramatically increased. Pretty much mm -hmm. knocks out all the background pigment and leaves it pretty much white. But there's still a lot of hues left uh, behind. And you have like, if you look underneath their throat, you'll see that they have like translucent scales as well. Okay. Wow. By, by the end of this one, we'll be working with Hognose again. Yeah, I feel like <laughs> that's true. <laughs> oh, nice. man. Those oh, are cool okay. animals, dude. So one more Super Arctic, and then I want you to sit back down. Um, you got like a Bub's Daddy laying around? I do. I do. I got um, – this one here, and this one's mighty probably a little more interesting. What's the Bob's daddy? Oh, you'll see. 
<laughs> it's, not, it's nothing too crazy. It's just like, you know, a cool name for a simple combination. Okay. There's a super Arctic albino anaconda. Oh, uh, that's cool. I love that. A bubblegum pink. Yep. yep. And that's where the name comes from. Bub's daddy's like an old school like uh, type of bubblegum that would come in like big yard sticks. <laughs> okay. Oh. Right on. That's awesome, man. Yeah, that's a pretty cool one. Okay. Oh, so the cool thing, too, that I find with, you know, I like talking about the mutations and where they came from. So, you know, you stumble across that animal. The show is awesome. And, like, I feel like there's been a few other hognose morphs, um, like with Dan Eby with the Sable Project, you know, kind of stumbling across that. Um, I don't remember the breeder's name, but we went to go to that lavender albino that one time. Uh, yeah, David, I mean, yeah, he's the originator yeah. of lavender hognose. Yeah, you got the, that was a really interesting one because it was like so lucky and so good that he did get the two hognose when, it, when he did get them. You got him at a reptile show. And essentially from the story, I mean, you know, I can't speak for him. So what Dave was telling me, um, I remember the gist of I know he bought two at a reptile show from a person. And it sounded like the person he got them from, I'm like positive they did not breed hognose. And that they had multiple babies that were produced from wild caught hognose and from Texas, West Texas locale. And he had bred corn snakes at the time. He wanted to get back into hognose. And he bought a pair of normals and uh, bred them together. And he produced lavender, a couple lavender. Or I think always only one lavender out of the first clutch. And that's how that whole project started. So, wow. You know. And that's we'll get a picture man. of that up when you're talking. <laughs> and then the same thing with the sable. Or not the same thing, but that was a couple animals. <laughs> Or wild caught animals that were normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, caught Montana locale. Um, yeah, hognos and yeah, bred together and produced the sable. I was just talking to Dan about that. Uh, I think about a week ago, about how he came across those and the whole story again. Yep, to his two uh, animals from the same like area around the same area where he's like would hurt and uh, you know kept them and bred them together. The uh, leucistic hognose wasn't that wasn't there a story behind that? Oh yeah, that's a big story. Uh, I think the guy's name was Brooke, and actually, because <laughs> I noticed one guy from um, uh, Fish and Wildlife, and I was talking to him about it because it's kind of a crazy story. But yeah, that's the thing I was too because I'm like I've noticed twice in a row. I was like, oh, from wildlife species, like from Texas and like you know uh, Montana and a few other states, that's okay. But they've cracked down more on laws with like you know uh, keeping and collecting. So, yeah, you can't do it from, like, any state western hognose occur. Um, but the, those states are still completely fine and a few others. The one that's been real iffy, or there's been a few that you can't, but Colorado is one. Colorado's laws are, are really odd. And if you, if you talk to, like, I guess Fish and Wildlife, because I talked to the uh, PAC, the, um, it's an organization for herps over there, and they're like, well, we've addressed it with, you know, people in Fish and Wildlife and DNR and they're like, yeah, they agree that the laws don't make sense, but they're pretty difficult to change. So they don't really want to change them unless right. he <laughs> makes it their mission and goes through the whole politics. But you're actually allowed to catch and keep hognose in Colorado as long as you live in Colorado. Um, it's actually, yeah, yeah, I'll look it up to, you know, be 100%, you know, sure, but. From what I recall, and I do know this is all true, you if you live in Colorado, you're allowed to collect and keep them. You can't keep them from like a, you know, preserve. But, you know, if you just go to like a state park or find one, you're allowed to keep them. You can keep up to like four a year. You're not allowed to um, have more than I think like 12 in your possession. That number may be smaller, but you're not allowed to uh, sell or um, cross state lines with them. So it's kind of hmm. like you know, basically you're allowed to collect, you know, and have them in your possession, but if you cross the state line, then you're Regular. somehow, yeah, committing an illegal act. So, <laughs> and that's what happened in Colorado. Um, but actually, his I think from the sounds of it, uh, what he says, his side of the story is that they were grandfathered in, uh, but they changed the law where they don't have that in effect. But the original ones that he had were be before that law passed. And then he started selling them. And I think he had some warning that he wasn't supposed to be selling them. And he continued to do so. And um, then they hit him with a bunch of, uh, and from what the guy I was talking to that knows all those uh, the details, 
he basically said that since he was selling um, a decent amount of them and they surpassed the $500 value because they were cystics, that it became a felony because it was over $500. And then every oh, state wow. line crossed, it was an additional felony. And so they just kind of tallied it up to make it sound like an absurd amount of felonies. And I know he got in a lot of trouble, so. Wow. That's nuts. <laughs> and there were a few other people that got in trouble without naming any names that had to go through the whole court process. And then yeah, was one did, one big breeder, and I know he uh, was pretty uh, uh, traumatized from it. <laughs> and then uh, a couple others, though, that were pretty big, and they just got theirs confiscated and taken, like, taken, and then nothing happened to them. So I don't know what um, prompted them to charge certain people and not others, um, you know, it uh, so they made a pretty big deal about it, and the animals ended up then in like the Kansas City Zoo. I heard the Denver Zoo. Then some people actually got them at the Kansas City Zoo, and eventually they got auctioned off and um, went to an individual, and he started breeding them and reselling them. And at that point, they didn't care that anybody had them, and, you know, have them now <laughs> captivity. So nice. even the ones you see now that are available are descendants from that original guy Brooke in Colorado, but they're legally, you know obtained through the zoos that had them then sold them well, that's a crazy story yeah yeah, of- yeah it is it's um I, yeah it's funny because i remember at the time when it happened i was like 13 and uh maybe i was a little maybe yeah 13 or 14 and i was thinking of a way to how to try to gather money and um buy hats you know for like you know within like a year or two i'm like i'd like to get a pair of hats and get into that project and good thing I didn't because they would have knocked on my door when I was like 14 or 15 and probably came and took <laughs> all of them. Um, maybe, I don't know. And maybe they would have left me alone because they're like, Hey, this 14 year old kid. And I, they probably wouldn't know. They probably would have, they're like, these animals are as legal as hell because uh, <laughs> they were transported and everything. But then, you know, I hear people from, I, I actually, I get um, people from Colorado. It happens every now and then. And I was having them in the back of my mind. Cause I'm like, you know what? I was, I was like, the one time I even guessed, I was like, I bet this guy's from Colorado. And they'll start talking to me and asking me questions and everything. And, you know, like, I want to buy the snake. And they'll send me money. And then they'll be like, here's my shipping address. And it's Colorado. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not shipping it to you. <laughs> um, I was like, I got to send you a refund. And they're like, oh, really? How come? And I'm like, well, your state laws, you know, are this, this, and that. I was like, you can go out. And that's the thing about their state laws. The state laws are in place. Um, and it's for, I think, any native species there. And those laws are in place so people don't collect them and keep them. I, I guess I guess that's the reason they have those laws, because you think they'd want to help the native, like Cryptofauna, but they um, are actually suggesting that you take them from the wild instead of buying one that's been captive born. Because yeah, That's nuts, man. Yeah, because uh, everybody that's trying to buy one from you, which is, you know, it's a completely legal hog nose, and the whole process is legal except for the just cross you know crossing the colorado even if it's a visual morph and you know there's not without a doubt that the snake is legal they could still consider just that act illegal but they're like well instead of buying a captive born hog nose you can just go out and try to find one and keep one and actually i know about three people that bought hog nose for or tried to buy hog nose for me that i had to you know refund um they well, at least two of those people i know actually have wild caught hog nose and um, the, I found out about how many you could keep and everything through one person. I remember some guy had some hog nose, and I was like, man, all those hog nose kind of look like they're just like standard normal wild cost. I was like, they kind of look like Colorado little cast, sort of like that area. And I looked at his profile, and then it was like he was in Colorado. And I'm like, and I messaged him directly. I'm like, hey, you're not allowed to own, you know, hog nose in Colorado and everything. And he goes, oh, no, yeah, I am. And he goes, these are all wild caught. He goes, it's just legal to take them. I'm like, no. And he goes, yeah. And then he sent me the link, and that's how I learned about it. <laughs> that's that's nuts laws, man. Jeez. Yeah. No CB. You got to collect from the wild. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. No captive born. Um, well, you're allowed to have captive born if you breed them, and then you have you hatch them yourself, but then you might be exceeding the legal limit. <laughs> and I don't know what they want you to do with them at that point. If you, they want you to <laughs> let them go, which isn't the smartest thing, because if you have other captive born culebrids, they could be disease vectors. So... You got to be um, careful there. But that, that law really needs to be changed. Um, the guy I know uh, with Fish and Wildlife in Illinois, he's actually been doing some pretty cool stuff with efforts and uh, getting out. He's been actually designing a permit 
so people can actually start breeding hoggos in Illinois because they're they're endangered in Illinois or critically endangered. There's only a couple little areas of their habitat left, um, you know, where where they exist. So I, I'm sure the range in Illinois was actually somewhat decent, but it's kind of the furthest eastern extent of where they exist. And um, but there's still a few areas, fragmented areas that they, a couple of them I think are like national parks and but they. Uh, um, still exist there and everything. And for a while you couldn't own Western hog nose there. And so he had a permit now where you can, uh, and it's, it's free and it's pretty easy to get. It only takes about 10, 15 minutes to fill out. And within a couple of months, you're allowed to own a Western hog nose. And there's a, something that's currently happening. He told me about, I can't remember exactly, but for, um, the time being, I actually have to go back to getting the old permit to vend Western hog nose at the Illinois, um, you know, reptile shows like Tinley and, but the new permit he's getting, um, is they're going to uh, actually enable people to start breeding Western hog nose. So pretty soon if you live in Illinois, you'll be able to breed and keep Western hog nose on a larger scale and a much easier, um, scale than before. Nice. It's pretty good. Yeah. He's cool Cause he's one of those guys that's, um, you know, with fish and wildlife and everything and knows the people in the DNR and he's actually kind of advocating for keeping or making it at least easy tracking the stuff and making sure people like, Oh, you know, pretty obvious, you know, if you buy a Western hog nose, it's illegal Western hog nose. Cause everybody's just, you know, breeding captive born. There's very few wild caught and all the interest is in color mutations and not normals. Nice. Um, so going back, I'm um, jumping to another species. Um, so like you said, leopard geckos were something you really started working with when you were younger too. Um, and I know you guys have done a lot of stuff in leopard geckos. You want to talk about a few of your highlights over the years in the leopard gecko breeding? Yeah, leopard geckos were um, really fun and it's uh, actually a really cool species to work with because um, you know they're kind of known as like a beginner species and something that's you know relatively straightforward and real easy and not really that difficult. But the one thing is there's a lot of things you can do with them as far as line breeding and um, just uh, color combinations and just, just, you know, messing with polygenetics, just selectively breeding. Almost every morph you see in leopard geckos, you'll see a large variety. And it's all, most of it's, you know, polygenetic traits you're seeing um, with a lot of those uh, leopard gecko mutations. I mean, other than like, you know, looking at super snows and, you know, snows and Trump albinos, but all those, um, you know, end up having polygenetics involved in them as well that uh, accelerate or, or change them and everything and make the projects uh, a lot more diverse. And the thing with leopard geckos is you can see a faster turnover and um, results of line breeding versus any other species because leopard geckos are very prolific and you can breed them at 10, 12 months old. Um, sometimes you can even breed them younger if they reach uh, you know adult size, especially your males. I used to breed males when I bred leopard geckos with my dad. We used to breed males at like sometimes seven months old. Um, you know, if they're like 50 grams and we could put them to a female um, that was, you know, producing egg follicles or, you know, you could, that's the other thing. Leopard geckos are very easy to see. Fat tail geckos too, the egg follicles in their belly. And so you can know really like, you know, when to pair them. And so you could get like a turnover where, you know, most species, you know, might take two years before you have a generation, the next generation, leopard gecko, you could have the next generation in like 10, 12 months. And so over a course nice. of seven years, you could see seven generations of line breeding versus with other species. You're gonna be lucky to, in seven years to see, you know, even four, you might be more around like three, four, you know, yeah, you might be, you know, four generations. So it's really good um, to learn, you know, the power of line breeding and what you can do with it and the way it kind of works. And um, it's just a, it's a lot of work, especially when you're breeding leopard geckos, like my dad and I did and fat tail geckos. Cause you know, if you do it on a larger scale, you're pretty much constantly having babies and <laughs> they, they eat a lot and they also shit a lot. So, you know, you have a lot of uh, work there. It's a lot of maintenance. It's almost like farming. Cause it's like, all right, you know, you got your females, you, you know, you got to check them for egg follicles, breed them, you have babies hatching. Then you have, you know, shipments, you know, we, do, we did wholesale and a lot of reptiles, you know, uh, shows and, um, and updating the website and all that. How's the uh, leopard gecko market these days? I know it, it uh, had a little bit of a downturn, but like, it seems like people are getting back into them again. 
Yeah, it's um, it's it's decent. It's not as good as it was at one time. Um, when leopard geckos really seemed to take off was like the mid two thousands. Um, it was really around the time Ron Trumper released the Eclipse um trait, mm-hmm. which is you know most uh, known for being in the combined with the Trumper albino gene, making what they call raptors. And at that time, they got really popular in uh. Europe. And so there was a big explosion, not only in the U.S., but then also the interest in color morphs and starting to, you know, breed leopard geckos again. And uh, um, just a, basically just a, uh, just with more morphs and everything, because at the time there weren't that many morphs like available over in Europe. I mean, there were a few base traits, but not a lot of people were, I think, breeding leopard geckos. I like a larger scale or working with projects at least towards the end goal. And so when the clip and Raptor gene were available and we started, we were just doing a lot of shipments to the, the ham Germany shows for people to pick them up there. And at that time there was, you know, lines of tangerines and snows who had just recently came out. So the hot things at the time were the max super snows and, you know, eclipse and Raptors and then just pretty combinations of like tangerine trumper albinos and um and actually yes shoot soon after that too the enigma came out and that kind of just accelerated the whole european um you know hobby aspect of leopard geckos over there and got a lot more people interested and then soon to follow after that was kind of like the whole asian market especially hong kong and china mm-hmm, right and, yeah and so and then since then it's kind of like there hasn't been a lot of new morphs coming out the most notable one would be black knights. And that's a really cool trait because that's all done through a selective breeding. That's a line bred trait, but it acts extremely powerful when you outcross. So you can take a black knight and breed it to something. And if you breed it back, you're immediately getting really dark babies. And that's, that's a trait that end goal is to get like a pretty much near jet black leopard gecko. Um, and they're kind of hard because you could breed two all black ones together. And since it's like a polygenetic trait and it's variable and it's not like a thing that runs a hundred percent true. You can breed two all black ones together and you'll still get some that have pattern um, huh. and they're not pitch black, but just kind of an overall dark appearance. And, um, you know, so there's a lot you can do with that trait still. Um, Cause I've seen people crossing them with stuff like blood mandarins and they're getting um, blood mandarins because from the name you can already tell it's a dark tangerine, you know, line bread trait. Um, and they're getting ones that are having the black pigmentation kind of masking the overall orange pigmentation and everything on the saddles. And so you got kind of this like hazy looking, um, emarine looking leopard goes. Emarines are ones where they're kind of like greenish on the saddle and then kind of a reddish orange background. And so you're getting these ones that have kind of like a black, uh, greenish saddles with like kind of an orange background, a real dirty coloration. And, and so that's the thing with line breeding. I mean, you could take ones that you're line bred to be almost all black and breed them to these ones that are high speckled with like tangerine coloration. And you can get these dirty mix of, black and orange ones. And then you can get ones that have barely any black knights showing up because, you know, it's just not showing up real strongly in that individual. But if you breed it back, they'll probably react and make it um, a lot more prominent in the next um, generation. And so then you could start the line breed ones that are more orange and black, or you can breed the ones that are have more of that emerine kind of look coming through where it's like a greenish black and um, just go in that direction. So there's so many different things you can do with leopard geckos. And that's, I guess, how I kind of like um, um, got really wanted to get into leopard geckos. Because when I first um, um, showed interest in them at the reptile shows, I seen a lot of different colorations, and, you know, like just different tangerines, high yellows, trumper albinos, and then a lot of, you know, jungle stuff and bold stripe stuff. And, you know, most of those were polygenetic outside, you know, the traits I seen that were like trumper albino and blizzard and uh, Murphy patternless. So, you mentioned something in there about the the European market and, you know, you're sending things over. Can you talk a little bit about, and, and kind of maybe a little bit of detail too, about exporting animals? Uh, I'm assuming you still export animals, maybe yeah. not right at this very moment because of what's going on in the world, but um, you still export animals and uh, you export them all over the world. Can you talk to us about like what brought you to that point and kind of like how you have to do it? You know, like a lot of people are like, man, I'd love to, to export some animals. But like, where do you start? And I know we kind of got a, into a little bit of uh, uh, 
buying or getting the uh, permits and things like that, but um, we never really exported anything. And uh, we're always interested in, in understanding what people do and how, how they do it. And so I'm told that you uh, export kind of yeah. a lot, though. Um, well, decent. I import and export non sighty species, though. I kind of don't like, uh, I don't mess with any sighties uh, when it comes to importation, exportation. So I don't know what species you guys do. Do, uh, do you breed like ball pythons and other like pythons or boas? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ball pythons, blue tongue skinks. We imported some blue tongues before and uh, never imported or exported ball pythons yet. But okay. Oh, ball pythons are actually the easiest I know with sighties because you can get the master sighties and they're, you know, the most. Uh, you know, popular, you know, uh, sighty species that's being imported and exported. But um, yeah, you can, you basically just have to kind of go through like a, a fish and wildlife and apply for an import export permit. And you'd actually have to call them and see about the sighties. Um, the sighty stuff, I know, I think they have to come out to your place and they have to see how many individual like kind of breeders you have. And I think that's how they base their master sighties, like on um, how many, like they kind of like, I guess guess how many babies you could produce from said females. That information might be inaccurate though, because I don't really um, uh, mess with too many sighties, uh, you know, species. So I do breed a few ball pythons and rainbow boas, but um, I don't, you know, import or export those. Um, but you know, you can get you can apply for master sighties, but applying for just regular importation exportation is uh, fairly easy unless you have a felony. If you have a felony, you're probably not going to be able to get one. Um, so as long as you have a felony. <laughs> um, like me, you can just apply through fish and wildlife and everything. And, um, you can ask them and they'll direct you in the right direction. And, yep. um, you just have to go through, you got to give them your address, you know, other information that they require. I don't even remember. Cause I keep renewing mine. I don't even really remember. Um, yeah. the first time, like, I know it wasn't like, it didn't take that long and it wasn't that difficult, but yeah, when you get not too bad. Species, um, I think it's, that that's can be tough because I sometimes you have to apply individually, um, and that's why I breed actually a lot of non sighted species. Um, I mean, most of them luck, I got lucky because my main interests are in you know um, geckos and then you know specifically like western hognose snakes. I like them a lot, and um, yeah, it's really nice to work with non sighted species because they're very easy to uh, transport without having any hassle. So, and then once you get the the permit. How did like how would I go about if I had the permit? How would I go about sending animals? If out? you live like, if you live in like Miami or say like you know somewhere in California, and there's like there's ones in like Chicago too where you can um, export yourself, um, or you could hire a broker and go through a broker to kind of um, sort out all the logistics, and then they use your they use your import. Uh, export permit and they basically are saying like hey we're shipping it on behalf of so and so and then it goes through official law wildlife inspection whether it's coming in or going out and uh that, that's pretty much it and so right the, the ham shows what we would typically do is um export over there and then pick it up myself i'd export it to myself um and pick it up and uh, yeah the first time i went i uh, went with uh somebody else and i declared the shipment on my own and that was pretty nerve-wracking because i was like 19 at the time and um <laughs> yeah i don't even know if i'd been out of the country at that time at that point it didn't really matter um but i was just kind of like you know nervous and uh it took a little while to clear the stuff over there i mean i remember it took like six hours mm -hmm. and um, i used to clear through the same guy and um so every time i'd go over to, to germany and export over there and clear the animals myself i'd go with my one friend that was from Holland or my other friends, uh, Torsten and uh, Bjorn uh, from Germany. And we had cleared uh, shipments and everything. And the guy that would clear my stuff, um, he spoke pretty decent English. Most people over there speak English. So it's not that hard to get around. You know, it's not like you're in a real foreign place because, you know, most people are fairly friendly. But the guy that had cleared my stuff, uh, or clear my stuff at um, uh, Dusseldorf, he really didn't like uh, the United States or Americans. And so the entire time for like about an hour or two, like when he'd go through the, like some of the paperwork to clear everything, he would just bitch to me about the United States and everything was wrong with it. And he was kind of clearing my stuff and, um, you know, would also charge for it. And so I just have to be nice to him. And so I'd agree with him. Like anytime he said anything about the United States, I'm like, yeah, man, it'd be like horrible living there. And I agree with him. I'm like, yeah, man. It's like, I was just born there. I was like, can't do anything about it. I, like, I want to leave so bad, even though I don't. Um, <laughs> 
Yeah, I just go through the whole thing and everything, and just like if he shit talks the United States and he say things about the, he went over there one time and the banks were horrible. And I'm like, yeah, I, was like, I don't even know why anybody keeps money there. You know, just <laughs> stuff. that's good. That's so, um, now did you vendor um, Japanese shows at one point also? What shows? Oh, did you say you vended in ja Japan at yeah, all? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I used to go to uh, you know the yeah the uh, Shizoka show over there. Um. I would like to go back, but I've had some health issues and everything, and um, very sensitive, as Dave knows. Dave knows the whole background of this. Very sensitive to food poisoning, so I got to be very careful. I shouldn't even say that. Somebody's going to try to poison me now. Somebody out there <laughs> doesn't like me. They're going to fuck with my food. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I used to go over to that. Actually, that was the best time I ever had is going over to Japan. Japan's awesome. They're pretty lax over there. Um, very safe country, very fun. Uh, it's very different and all always like you know. So if you want to get food there, food extremely different. Like they have noodle shops. Um, you know they have food like you know places where you could go and you just like collect something on a vending machine and you know they give you like just different course meals and that probably doesn't sound interesting. But whatever when I was eating there, I don't know exactly. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was always really good. And um, then we go to like a lot of different specialty restaurants and there's just so much over there. Cause it's like, uh, it would always be like outside of Tokyo and, um, except for when we're in Shizuoka, cause that's a couple hours from Tokyo, but even out there, there's just always something to do. So like, if you're like, I'd be mostly staying in like the Yokohama area. And if you wanted to go out and have like sushi or get a barbecue at 3 a.m., you could, you know, it's a very happening city. There's it's, lights are on everywhere. You know, you can always go out and do whatever you wanted. And, um, you know, there, the malls there, there'd be all kinds of like cool malls to go to where you'd have like, you know, anime shops and, you know, just everything was very different. There wasn't anything that was like that similar to the United States. And the shows over there were, were cool too, you know, near um You'd see a lot of interesting species. Like I got the whole like baby river otters and interact with them. Um, there's a guy with a toucan, and I was asking him if I could hold that, and he's like, "No, I can't hold my toucan." And uh, pulled a giant um, Indonesian flying squirrel, and it was like yeah. huge. It was, like it took up like my whole torso. And um, actually, Brian Barczyk was there, and he was like at that one, and um, did, I think it was uh, the flying squirrel, and um, I was holding it, and then Brian's like you know, holding something else that I'm like, do you want to hold the giant flying squirrel? Or somebody offered it to him. He's like, I don't know about that. And they're like, no, just hold it. It's fine. And he's like, all right, I'll hold that then. And um, then the, they had fennec foxes. And um, the one time they had, uh, I think it was uh, uh, thorny devils there, uh, the Australian uh, thorny devils. And they were there on display. Yeah, nobody ever, yeah, those aren't something that's like kept in captivity. And um Right. <laughs> um, he Sykes was there and he went over there and looked at him and uh, I kept meaning to go over there and I was like, I'll go over there in a minute. And then like at the end of the show, I was like, oh shit, I forgot to go. I was like, I'll go tomorrow. And then I ended up not seeing those, but um, yeah, and they had a lot of owls there too. Like you'd have all kinds. And my friend who's in the uh, wildlife uh, rehabilitation, he's in the um, Western Cleveland area and he re rehabilitates a lot of wildlife and his, um, he's just real into birds. So his forte is like knowing native species of birds and everything North American and outside North America. But I showed him a bunch of the owls and he was, man, they have them just lined up like that. Cause he had, he's like certain species goes that species of that size would eat that one. Um, and they were just all on this row, um, <laughs> sitting there on the plane and they'd had just these little links under, um, on the, the, the base of their, um, legs and everything. So they couldn't like try to like, fly or get away but most of them were pretty pretty cool and they'd let you hold the baby like burrowing owls and they had great horned owls and a few other species i'm not i don't know too much about birds and they had some hawks there too and falcons but uh That's i didn't hold any of those but yeah there's a lot of neat stuff there so um i'm trying to get an idea of scale at this show um when it comes to the size of the show they're about or what show would you compare it to in the united states size wise it's not very large. I mean, it's big, but there's not like there's not like teaming with vendors. Um, it's not like super easy to get into. Um, I'd imagine they have a pretty long wait list, but if you're from overseas, they usually make an exception. Um, and I don't know if they've expanded, but there's other shows over there. And I think they're all around pretty much the same size, but the Shizoka show, the main show, 
I'd say it's about half the size of Tinley, but one, one quarter of it, they don't really have ammo to display. They, well, they have stuff over there to display, not to purchase, but like, you know, things that you can see. And then they have like kind of like a little auction stage. Might be slightly smaller than that. Um, slightly smaller than half the size of Tinley. It's probably a little bigger than Hamburg, but it's a nice show. Um, it's, uh, they have all the bird people and all the people that breed owls and um, the exotic stuff like, you know, river otters and fennec foxes. And one guy had flamingos. They have them up toward the north side of the show. And the south side is just kind of people with regular reptiles. And one cool thing about that show is that's probably the, probably the most Bolins pythons I've ever seen is going to the Japan shows. There'd always be a few people there with like sub adult or adult and sometimes even young Bolins pythons. Um, and you could probably, some shows I'd see six or 10 Bolins pythons. Um, you know, I don't know if they're still that um, common over there. Um, well, I wouldn't use the word common, but at least, you know, if there's still that many when you go to the shows. Yeah, you get one or none here, so that's pretty. <laughs> right, exactly. And that's the thing. When I see them over there, I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool, Bolins python. And, um, you know, I'd see them from time to time in the United States. And now I don't even remember the last time I even seen one over here. Uh, but when I go over there, there'd always be a few. There'd always be at least like you know four or five bowling spikes on here. That's cool. Yeah, Kevin had one at Tinley in October. Yeah, uh, there you go. So, yeah, pretty much the only person I can think of now that has them is yeah, nerd is uh, Kevin. I know he's got a few, and the prices have drastically increased. I seen what he's asking for his. I'm like, man, it's like they went up like quite a bit. Lot. I, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I I think they're. Now, I don't know if they're still allowing export for them out of Indonesia. And um, cause I know that's where they would get some of their, um, you know, uh, bull pythons over there in Japan. And I'm sure over in the United States as well. Uh, I don't know if they have a number cap that they're allowed to export out of there or if they're being restricted now um, from the farm raised babies or, you know, I don't know how that the, the, the old, you know, over there works. Because again, that's with sighty species. So, sure. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing with Bowens too. Like, I think it was like 2005 or six. I was offered a Bowens for like eight hundred dollars or twelve hundred dollars. What? Now like, the price is absolutely insane. Yeah, that's what I was. I was looking at getting like possibly Bowens, but you know, like, they'd be a cool species to have. It'd be one of those ones that you know, extremely difficult to breed in captivity, and um, um, they're they're very very well. interesting looking constrictors. You know, with the, the iridescence. Um, and I know they come from like cooler climates and they've even found where they, you know, in their um, habitat and you know, uh, where they find them and can get down to as low as like 40 degrees and they'll find them, you know, themselves in these like cooler temperatures. And um, I think one, I seen that somebody sent me a video and it was Kevin's and he had a setup where he had kind of an memorial setup. He had like a basking light for him. And so I'd imagine he kind of kept the ambient kind of on the cool side or at least, you know, moderate. And so then they for him to really warm. They have to get under that basking spot, which is pretty, you know, he had a pretty good setup for getting him close to like, you know, um, you, you know, just replicating their, you know, wild habitat and everything, which is, you know, probably key to getting him to go. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I think they might be more of like a montane species. So maybe if you lived in like Denver or higher elevations, maybe that would help. But yeah, I don't yeah. know much about them. I do know they're cool as shit, though. <laughs> yeah, we we uh we've always talked about that the elevation thing and uh you know being possibly being a factor. Yeah, I could see it being a factor, especially with the uh, lack of success a lot of people are having. So it's like okay, there's gotta be a reason for that. Um, you know, might be something in diet too. You might want to supplement with more vitamins because I don't know. I mean, you're saying people are getting you know success with emerald tree boas and green tree pythons, and I imagine their diet is kind of similar. Um, that's one thing I would actually like. I kind of wonder what bull and beet in the wild, you know, if they're eating more like, uh, you know, tree dwelling, like kind of rodents, or if they're coming down to the ground to hunt and they're eating primarily rodents, or if they're eating, you know, lizards, um, mm -hmm. um, or if they're eating, you know, bird, bird stew yeah. or bird eggs, you know, maybe raiding a nest. I mean, I mean, I've never like, you know, corn snakes and like black rat snakes, they often raid bird nests and everything and will eat eggs. So. I mean, that wouldn't surprise me to see a python eating eggs, even though it's not typical, you know, behavior you see from, you know, like a python. Um, yeah, we can know. ask Ari. <laughs> yeah, you can always put in chicken eggs with one and it doesn't eat. And then it's like, you know, it's like that's not something that doesn't ever raid like nests in a while. So it doesn't have interest in it. And then it's like, OK, I just kind of look stupid for thinking that it maybe ate bird eggs to, uh, possibly. And if they did, it'd probably be at like a younger age, too, because they get pretty big and, you know, it would mm -hmm. take a lot of 
eggs and pretty large eggs for her to fill up a you know a larger one. Um, so yeah, I actually I kind of didn't think of that because bones they get like ten foot long, I think yeah. around like yep. yeah there. So, so uh, you know, talk more about the breeding because I feel like everybody in this industry loves the challenge, and that's why a lot of people went out and got them when they were able to get them. But um, so there has been some hybridizations between using a male Bowens and putting it with, I think, a carpet python. And I'm not sure if they've done it with anything else. Oh, really? I didn't know they did hybrids with Bowens. I know it makes I mean, they do the green trees and the carpets. And um, I'd imagine a Bowens, especially because they're from, you know, you know, just north of Australia in like the New Guinea area, I believe. Um, and, you know, there's carpet pythons where you got the ear and gyas, but in – uh, Australia and everything, you'd imagine the look of the carpet python, the size and everything that they kind of have maybe similar, you know, uh, diets too, possibly. Um, well, I guess one of my questions was with that after I saw it, actually I just saw that, um, I saw it last night. Um, now with the males being able to cycle, cause it was a male Bowens in the pairing, do you think it could be more with something to do with the follicle development in a female that's a little more difficult? Um, like you said, whether it's some dietary pressures, temperature, and that could be one of the bigger issues, not so much with the male, but with the female Bowens. Yeah, maybe. I mean, if these guys are getting like visual locks with their Bowens and then the, like, you know, the common thing is they're female plugging <laughs> out. Um, I'd actually almost wonder if it's a temperature thing. Because usually when you're having fertile males like that, because obviously you have the bones uh, male and he's fertilizing the carpet female and they're getting good eggs. Now, if they're doing that, like how many like hybrids have they done like that? Just like one or two? You know what? It was just, I can't remember who I talked to about it last night and I got the picture and we could put it up as we're talking about this. But um, I know at least with the carpet python, I'm not sure if they've done anything else. Yeah, it might, it might be more of an issue than with the uh, people with uh, their dune bones. It might, maybe it could be an issue with their females and their, you know, the males are completely fertile. If the males, you know, um, fertilizing a carpet female that easily, I wouldn't think it's just luck. Um, yeah, it might have something to do with the female and that could be diet. I mean, even adding like supplements to their diet, I don't think, you know, that would be, uh, that's definitely not going to hurt anything. Uh, Kevin set up, I believe his, you know, bulbs, you see him with, they gotta be, you know, UVB. And so he's probably got that covered. Um, but I'm wondering if cooler temperatures, um, you might want, I'm sure he might do it and it might maybe taking things from another species you breed like ball pythons and, um, you know, going over them with an ultrasound to try to, you know, better your success. Maybe if you have like two bones males and I'd probably breed them at the lower range of temperatures. Um, I mean, because the Brazilian rainbow bows are actually a very easy species to breed, and that's a, a species I don't have a lot of, but I've kind of kept them from the time I was 18, and I breed a few here and there. And I've talked to people that think Brazilian rainbow bows are kind of tough and or didn't have much success. And all that uh, lack of success was pretty much just correlated to them keeping them at too high temperatures, because Brazilian rainbows come from northern Brazil, Guyana, French Guiana, and uh, like parts of Suriname and all those areas are kind of like cooler temperature rainforest. The average like temperature is like in the mid seventies year round. They just have like a dry season, then a rainy season. And these things are living more in kind of like the swampy uh, marshy areas. Um, and if you breed them like, and you just keep them in the high seventies, low eighties, you're probably going to have pretty good success. But if you're keeping them at higher temperatures, they definitely don't appreciate the higher temperatures. And it's kind of like, I actually, I know blood pythons are kind of like that too. So some people are like, you keep your blood pythons at high temps, they're actually uh, more defensive and nippy. And if you keep them at more of their kind of comfortable temperatures, like blood pythons actually kind of, I guess, prefer it like low 80s and even up mm -hmm. to like high 70s. They don't really like these real hot, like uh, climates that say people think they, um, you know, might like, or some people might think they like. So, and that's the thing with Brazilian rainbows. I'd actually noticed that I, my, my adult males would digest like full size rat meals and like, at like 72 degrees. So if they're able to fully digest stuff at 72 degrees with like no issues and everything, and um, you know, they're obviously, you know, and just by looking at their climate from where they're, they're, they're at, they don't really like that high of temperatures. And you know, I've always, that's the one issue too with me selling Brazilians. Um, and I always try to go over with people, um, especially new keepers, I'm like, hey, these things don't like it hot. Don't put a bulb in there and don't have a spot in there. It's like over 90 degrees because you can kill them with those you know, real high temperatures. And cause you know, some people put them in like, you know, an area and 
have like a hot spot of like 95 and even if the ambient temperature is acceptable on the cool side sometimes they end up still killing them like that and so i'm assuming bowling's where they come from and just what i've heard that the cooler temperatures might be key to them and then having those kind of basking spots like kevin has set up then and like maybe keeping them in the 70s so we we spoke with uh we did an interview with um robin marklin from uh uh, pro, exotics. pro exotics. I don't know. I oh, just formerly, uh, formerly pro exotics. So he had uh, a few Bowens pythons as well, and they would um, they would check for the follicles, and they follicles would grow. They'd have a ton of follicles, and then just nothing would happen. They'd have the male in there. They'd lock. They'd see locks, and nothing happened. The problem he said, is the females would reabsorb. Is what they wouldn't even slug out. Right, no, right. Yeah, they reabsorb them. Huh. That's pretty interesting, especially if they're getting locks from the male. Um, yeah, that's wild. Yeah, you kind of wonder where, like, I mean, they're reabsorbing them. It's like, Good. yeah, why are they reabsorbing them? Or to tell, yeah. like, I think that the temperature is really one in effect because if they're being bred and they're stimulated and, you know, they're bred the female has a sperm, she has the follicles, they're maturing, and then they go past and they reabsorb. I mean, I've seen that with, with uh, Western hog nose. And, um, you know, I mean, they're a much, obviously, way easier species to breed. Uh, they're pretty beginner-level species. They're a little more difficult than certain colubrids, and they're definitely quirky, and they're not extremely straightforward, and they'll definitely throw some curveballs at you, especially if you're breeding multiples. But um, the egg follicle reabsorption, I mean, seems kind of be more sporadic with them and not, like, something I can actually pinpoint. I do know if you, again, supplementing, when you supplement them, it's less likely to happen. Um, but again, I mean, I've seen, you know, well, I've seen bowling slug out and then there are also ones reabsorbing them. And so the ones are being reabsorbed, it, it, shoot, it almost sounds like they're not being obviously fertilized because the ones that are reabsorbing and then there's other ones that are ovulating and going through the whole uh, cycle, but then they're slugging out. So, hmm. yeah, that's a, that's a tricky one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I don't, okay, well, um, well, I don't really, yeah, I mean, we're now we're talking about Bowen's pythons. They're cool. I love this species, but I'm like, ah, man, we're talking about Bowen's python. I'm talking about ideas to breed them, and I've never even friggin' kept, kept one. I mean, I'm using <laughs> lots of ideas from other species or things that, you know, could maybe help, but, you know. I'm probably definitely not the best person to ask. Um, I don't know. Has Kevin had any luck with them? Well, it depends on who you talk to. We, oh, won't, get in, we won't get into that, I guess. <laughs> well, okay. So um, Diana, skink breeder, um, she posted something on her business page a few months ago of a breeder in Europe that showed the whole process. He showed um, the Bowens next to a newspaper, I think, when it ovulated showed it next to a newspaper as it was laying eggs. Like just, mm -hmm. I'm not screwing around. I actually made this happen. I've never researched that breeder, but I know I stumbled across that a few months ago when he posted it. So, you know, yeah, people can be successful with it. I don't think many people in the United States have been. Yeah, there's only um, a it's got to be a very short list, maybe less than three or four people in all honesty. And that might even be too many. I don't know. I think there was a guy in the Netherlands that's done a twice in a year. He's gotten very small, like, three or four eggs that he's actually gotten to come to term and, and produce babies. And that guy in Costa Rica uh, has done it a couple of times, but you're talking about large pythons that should produce, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, 20, 30. maybe 30 eggs. Right. And you're getting three. Like, <laughs> I don't know if you call that success. Like you got them to, to, to do the process, but I don't know. They're on the right track at least. They got a little bit of it. They're on the coattails of, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, yeah. They're right there. I know in Europe, it's more common for them to do um, big, you know, terrariums and more like bioactive kind of setups. Mm -hmm. So maybe that guy is doing something more like that. I mean, that could be the key. And that's because, yeah, so I kind of seen Kevin's setup. And I was like, the person that sent me the video and I seen that, I was like, I was like that seems like a pretty decent setup. Um, you know, as large, he had arboreal areas, areas from the basket. And uh, I mean, yeah, it just seems like, it, it seems like there's something like, pretty key missing and i don't know if maybe it's a, yeah i don't know you wouldn't think they'd be a species that like breeds in like balls or anything like that where you'd have like multiple males but you know maybe having multiple males might help especially if they're getting some success but it's real low fertility 
because David and I talked about like green anacondas. Green anacondas is another big, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, difficult species to, to breed. And when people do get them to reproduce, typically there seems to be a lot of um, infertile, you know, slugs in the litters as well. And actually, I know, yeah, Kevin, I know he had a pretty good sized litter of those, and that's another difficult one to, to breed. Um, I think that species, though, the issue with that one might be because, I mean, they show up right in the wild when they're breeding. You know, there's like five, six, seven males all trying to breed one female. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, that seems like, well, most people are just doing a single pair, so maybe the multiple males and then breeding them in, you know, large pools of water is going to, you know, help you get uh, better fertility with those guys. Um, I've heard that with some of the bigger females with anacondas, but, um, you know, I've been talking more with like Megan Kelly and I've been talking a lot with Blake lately. Um, and you know, Nerdus had their success also. I don't know if it's actually that difficult of a species to breed. Just not many people have ever had to try to breed them because in the past they were so readily available for imports. Right. So there wasn't yeah. a big drive for it, but, um, you know, there's been quite a few different breeders that have had success with them over the last few years, and I just wonder if it was a lack of trying over the years. Yeah. Does Megan get pretty good uh, litters as far as fertility and everything? Um, fertility is also really good with her, I found. Um, you know, very low percentage of slugs. You know, she usually has a camera in it with her cage, so okay. you know, if mom's going around collecting those slugs, she'll see it afterwards. But, um, you know, Ryan made a comment about with the Bowens. Um, I don't really know how many... Um, eggs though that species has on average and like with anacondas um you know there's a recent litter that she had and this anaconda was probably about 10 to 12 years old and it was giant and mm -hmm. it only had nine or ten babies and no slugs wow. so with that um i don't think it's necessarily age but you know year after year i know the litters are going to get bigger but, um, you know, for such a big species, you'd think there'd be a lot. But um, for some of the younger females or the females that have only had a litter or two, it's a very small litter. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, I'd expect the green anacondas to have larger litters. So that's interesting. Um, it's definitely probably not going to be too much wear on the mom, though, um, having that small litter, especially at that size, like a 10, 12-year-old female. But, yeah, like bones and stuff, I do know they lay bigger clutches. They have bigger litters the older they get. So, I mean, that's pretty old, though, like 10, 12 years old. Um, I wonder if, like, you have green anaconda females that are, like, 20 years old, if they start having litters, like, they have, like, 20, 30-plus babies in them. That's how, like, so my another thing – oh, sorry. With the big girl that just went for her not too long ago, I think it was, like, December, January, um, that female was 10, 12 years old, but she was a virgin. So oh. that was her first litter. And it was wow. actually exactly 10 babies. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, because my Brazilians, um, when I breed them, and they're another species that, uh, I mean, they're small, um, and their next closest relative are actually like anacondas, like yellow anacondas, the next closest, you know, uh, relative species to like rainbow boas. Um, and then, you know, there's other things related to like the epicrets, like, you know, the Puerto Rican boas and stuff like that. But um, my Brazilians, when I breed them at like four or five years old, because it's a species that, I mean, people bred them younger, but if you talk to the bigger rainbow boa breeders, they typically, um, the age helps a lot. Like I, a lot of my Brazilians won't start breeding until they're four or five years old. And I actually had a male that wouldn't even touch or show any interest in a female until he was like about six or seven. But when they breed around the age of five, usually around for the first time, typically their litters are around like eight, 10, 12 babies, sometimes a little more. And then I had a female I picked up um, that was like, uh, I think closer to 20 years old. And she's like a little over six foot long and she'd have uh, litters. And he is actually getting rid of her because he thought she's getting too old to breed. But I know a lot of boas can live. If you kept them, you know, keep them uh, real healthy. A lot of them can live to late thirties. And, you know, I've seen like Tracy Barker and stuff. And she had like Kenyon Sambo as having babies. We were talking about that one time, Dave, is having like babies in the late twenties. And um, so I was like, oh, this Brazilian was like late teens, close to 20. I'm like, she still breed for many years. And so she has litters of like 22 to 23, 24 babies. And that same guy had a female that was like close to 20 years old and it had like a litter of 39 babies. So age, and then maybe that's one of the things with Bolins too. Although I know these guys had them for a while. So I, I'm thinking age isn't as big of a um, deal with them, but um, age always seems to help. Oh, it seems with a lot of those species. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, Ryan, or I'm sorry. Either you guys have something or you want me to keep going? I, I had a I had a one on one question. Since we're talking about kind of, you know, breeding things, how about what about a species that you work with, like hognose? Um, so 
a lot of people have trouble starting hog nose when they're babies on eating. Can you give some tips to people that are listening on starting hog nose? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because that's what that's what I breed. So we should be talking about those five more. <laughs> oh, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, I love the bones yeah. conversation. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. But it's interesting. Yeah, we'll be talking about a species I never kept before. See how we can <laughs> brainstorm over breeding Bowen's pythons from afar. This guy <laughs> has he's got a light on. I think this is how he does it. Um, with well, hog nose. That's the one kind of like the one kind of kind of a misconception that or. One, um, um, uh, can't think of the word, but uh, the one thing that people think about about the hog nose line is like, hey, they can be stubborn feeders when they first hatch, and that can be somewhat true for a small percentage of them. But uh, one thing is, is keeping them at, um, you know, good stable temperatures. If you have a warmer ambient temperature, that helps a lot. If you have them like at an ambient temp of like 81, 82, 83, even 84. That's going to help a lot in a hot spot of high 80s to low 90s. You can even go a little hotter. Um, it's not necessary. But um, the first thing is they hatch, and they typically shed within hours or a day after they shed or after they hatch. Um, and so, like with other cooler birds, most people are like, oh, you have corn to wait until their first shed, which is about a week after. So hog knows, um, I've had them eat as early as three or four days after hatching, but most will not eat that quickly. Um, they hatch out with pretty large yolk sacs. Um, and there's actually a bunch of different tips I could give you. I've noticed um, if you hatch them in an egg box with like, I keep them on coca coir. If you hatch them in an egg box and you leave them in there for say five, seven days, eight days, keep it misted so they, have, they stay hydrated and they can drink the water droplets or the soil is usually um, moist enough where they don't have to, um, that they don't really even get thirsty um, until probably like a week out. But um, if you feed them together, your success rate of them eating from where they first hatch is a lot higher. And that probably has to do with them being in uh, familiar, you know, grounds, inst you know, instinctively. They've hatched. Um, all the other baby scents are, are around them. Um, and when I keep them together, they actually have a way better um, uh, feeding rate. And I actually don't do that that often, even though you have a good success. I do typically still separate them. Um and the reason for that is it's just kind of like when you're hatching out hundreds of them and keeping them all together, um, when you feed them, you kind of have to keep an eye out because mm -hmm. once they're done feeding, some of those ones will still be pretty um, aggressive towards feeding and they're still pretty stimulated from that just uh, just that recent feeding. And they might smell food on another one and immediately go to start chewing on them or they might start trying to devour a pinky that the other one has in its mouth. So when I'd feed them like that, obviously, you got to watch them. So you got to sit there with them all in front of you. And just kind of make sure everything goes right. Um, and then if they're all done and fed and everything and you missed them, you kind of wash them off and kind of get them like a little disturbed afterwards. So they're kind of like, you know, disinterested from food and everything. And they kind of go into more of like a, a flight defensive response after they're done feeding versus being in food mode. And, you know, you wash off their face with the spray bottle. You get that mouse scent and you can put them somewhere warm. And then you can give, do that a following feeding, then, then set them up. Or you could feed them that first time and then immediately set them up. But what I do is I hatch them. I usually do leave them in the egg box for uh, about five days to a week. Um, they hatch out with pretty large yolk sacs. And then I set them up in my rack systems. I individually label them like this. These are um, a little bigger enclosure kind of for them when they first hatch. Um, they grow into them, though. But, you know, your average baby hog nose is around, like, four, five, six, seven grams, depending. You know, I've hatched them all the way from, like, one gram up to 13 grams. Um, anything over nine grams is pretty large. So I'm getting a lot of five to seven gram babies and I'll set them up and I usually give them. And the thing is I've had babies that don't eat for like two weeks, uh, three weeks, and then they start showing interest. So when you first go to feed them, if they're only five, seven days old and like half of them don't eat or three quarters, definitely don't be like discouraged or think it's anything you're doing wrong. They just might not have their full appetite up yet. And there's a bunch of different tricks you can do. Um, the first thing I uh, ever learned to do was um, when I was 14, um, I'd give them frozen thawed pinks and I'd have babies that would won't refuse to eat. And so I would just tear the pinky's face open and squeeze some of the brains out um, um, of the frozen thawed pink, put it up to their mouth, and they would start drinking a lot of fluids and they'd show interest and grab it. And I kind of was like, well, you know, they're drinking it. So then I started dipping them in water and then doing that, tearing the face a little bit, dipping it in water. And then just getting that act of them drinking. Because the thing is, 
if you can get them to drink and you can get them to stop to drink for one, you're getting them kind of out of their explore kind of like, you know, looking around mode. Um, mm-hmm. uh, even if they are just sitting there and you just put that right up to their mouth and just start letting them drink for one, they're drink, you know, they're drinking it. So they're going to taste it. That's going to go over to Jacobson's organ in the roof of their mouth. And that's going to stimulate their appetite. So you'll see them actually, you can even see the change. You put it right up to their mouth, you see them drinking their cheeks moving, everything. You just kind of see them stop, and then they'll just grab it a lot of times. And you don't even need to typically scent. And I call that kind of like the water trick. You just dip the pinky head in water. And sometimes you don't even need to tear the pinky's face. But tearing the pinky's face and squeezing a little bit, getting a little bit of that blood and juices in there um, gives them um, a little more um, flavor for them to, you know, discern that that's, you know, a food item. And then you can do that same trick. And that trick works really well with scenting because, for one, you're getting them to drink. So you're getting them to uh, taste that and everything. So that's the best way for any scenting method also, because if you give, let's say, a frog or toad scent, and then they're drinking with a frog or toad scent um, on that pinky, then again, they are, you know, taking that in through, you know, through drinking, and they're tasting that, and then they're probably going to get a feeding response. And you can use uh, frogs for scenting. Um, I use the the frog leg, I make frog leg broth. That seems like, it seems like a really good idea, but it really doesn't work that great. Um, I would get frog legs and I would cook it down into like a stock with bones and everything. Like you'd make a chicken stock and I would keep it individually in cups. And when you make a stock too, it brings out more like, say if you're making a chicken stock for like, you know, you're making a soup for your family that brings out a lot of the flavor. So I'm like, you know what? This is a good fucking idea. I came up with, this is going to be like the end all to getting hoggos to eat. And it works like maybe like 10%, 20% better than the water trick. It's not like, I'm a bitch. Um, sardine juice works really well and I think it's because it's so strong and if you smell like like frogs too and everything um, not that most people do that but they kind of have a, like a fishy you know, smell um, a little bit and if you eat frog legs it even has a bit of a fishy taste and so like the um, sar- a sardine juice is just really strong and potent and that gets a pretty good reaction out of them uh, the sardine uh, juice I tell a lot of people that and they'll come back um, you can use uh, toads um, and everything in frogs, salamanders. Um, I've actually had one that would eat salamander scent and then not eat frog scent. And then, you know, you're, oh, uh, salamander scent works for quite a few. And you're like, this is like way better than frog. And then I'll try salamander scent and then other ones don't want it. And then I try frog scent and then they do eat it or they want sardine. Um, but it typically, when, they're, when I'm getting ones on frog or salamander scent or anything like that, that's because uh, the sardine juice isn't working. And then another thing is, too, is live pinks. Live pinks uh, work um, pretty well. And then you can even scent a live pink. Because uh, I've had baby hognose that aren't too interested in feeding. And you put in a live pink, even though I hate feeding live. Um, and they'll, they'll go towards, you know, to the live because of that movement and everything. And uh, small percentage want live, but it definitely helps. If you have, like, a bunch of hognose that haven't eaten a few times in a row and you throw in live, Probably a good 50, 60 percent of those are going to eat a live pink. So when you're talking about using all these different techniques, like and like how what percentage would you say of your baby hog nose you actually have to go to these extremes? Um, well, here's the thing. It's like pretty much any species. Like I'll, I'll well, I'll go to more depth what I mean by that. When I talk to like a ball python breeder and they like might see what I do with hog nose, they're like, man, that seems like a bitch. I don't want to like that sounds like a lot of work. But then I look at a ball python breeder and I'm like, yeah, I got a few mine African soft birds and I breed rats. I'm like, yeah, that sounds fucking horrible. I would never do that. Um, <laughs> you know, and I get the same thing like ball python breeders breeding leopard geckos and leopard gecko breeders breeding ball pythons. When you get used to like a couple species or like one species that you're particularly, um, you know, breeding or you're interested is in, once you figure it out, all of these little techniques don't really seem like much of a nuisance. Because um, I, I, I basically I have my computer right now on my uh, one food cart. What I'll do is I'll lay out paper, um, butcher paper and everything, and I'll have my pinkies, and I'll have cups of water, and I'll have cups of sardine, and I'll just take a uh, pinky, and I'll go through in a row, um, and, like, this is the very first rack I had over here um, that started eating for me this season, past season, because they were the first babies to hatch, and I'm going to pretty much always go with the water trick right away, because if you're doing it right away, it's actually, for one, you're getting a lot better uh uh, feeding rate like I got like 95% of those babies um, I was actually kind of surprised because it's like my brand new building and brand new setup and I was like okay the air temperature is a little off um, I kind of moved these things around a lot I was like I'm thinking I'm going to have a pretty poor success rate and I think I'm going to get pissed off here real quick talk <laughs> about stop breeding hogs for the millionth time 
Same with you guys. It goes back to normal. It's fun again. But I went through like 95% of them all ate. But I just go through. I take the pinky and uh, tear the, just the nose a little bit and just dip it in water. And then I just go take out the tub and put it right up to their mouth and get them to, you know, grab it and everything and hold it there. And if they don't, I'd leave it in there. And then I'd come back and take them out. And again, if you leave them in there, especially on their first um, go of feeding or even a second go, if you leave the pinky in there with a uh, torn face and water or even scented, usually the success rate for them coming back and eating that is fairly low. So I definitely go back through and make sure to take the pinkies out. Um, and then that's pretty much what I did. Um, I just go through and use the water trick. And as they become better feeders and more uh, stronger feeders, I kind of get away from that. And I stop di uh, dipping their heads in the water. And so a lot of them, you don't even have to tear their face. You just dip them in water. So you just, you just have them set up. You just dip them in water and put it right up to their face. So it really isn't, you know, too difficult to dip. Um, and then there's another thing to do. Here's actually one of my big um, fail safes. And actually my friend gave me this idea because he actually had some baby hogs. They weren't eating for him. And it made a lot of sense. He's like, well, these things are not eating. Um, and he cools all the stuff at the same time of year as my friend, John. And so he cooled all of them uh, along with a couple of these four feeders. And I was over there and he goes, he goes, yeah, man. He goes, this one wasn't eating. He goes, I took it out of cool down. He goes, not a thing. He's great. I'm like, that makes a lot of sense because they hatch out very late in the season from a lot of range that they live in. Um, even in Montana, they're hatching out like, uh, early October end of September. And they're pretty much hatching out into the fall season and the downturn of the season when it's getting closer to hibernating and going into brumation. So most of these baby hognose, just I, I can, I know in the wild, they are not eating after they hatch. That's why they have large yolk sacs. And mm -hmm. as in, a, in captivity, they don't really have a strong interest usually until they're a little older. And it's because, um, you know, they're pretty much getting ready to go into cool down or hibernation, brumation, right out, like as soon after uh, they're out of the egg in the wild. And some of them I'm sure are eating especially in the more Southern regions, like Southwestern, like, um, um, you know, like uh, Texas and everything and like, you know, parts of New Mexico and part of their Southwestern range. But, um, you know, they, they find the babies eating a lot of interesting things like lizard eggs. And if they're eating like ground skink eggs and like six line race runner eggs, I don't, they're not producing in the late fall. That's more of a springtime summer thing. They're laying multiple clutches and, um, you know, they're going after, you know, toadlets and froglets and, there's probably some of those in the fall for sure. You know, um, you know, like where I live, there's a lot of um, uh, gray tree frog and uh, spring peeper uh, metamorphosing in the end of summer. And so those would actually be pretty much perfect hogging size. And I know in the more uh, central uh, regions, they have similar species like chorus frogs. And they, they eat a lot of tiger salamanders in the wild too. Hmm. Um, but I don't think the uh, babies are finding too many recently metamorphosed tiger salamanders. But the one thing is, if you have a lot of babies hatch and they're not feeding, and I started doing that, I hibernate them. And when you warm them up, a lot of them are strong feeders. And then also the ambient temperature thing. Because a lot of people will buy hog nose, and they'll buy one that's a good feeder. And it's happened to everybody that breeds uh, hog nose. They'll have one that's feeding regularly, very well. They send it to somebody. person puts it in, like, a huge 40-gallon setup or 20-gallon setup. And you even kind of, like, if you're like me, a lot of other breeders, too, they're like, eh. Like, man, I sure hope that thing stays on eating because you just completely change. And a lot of it has to do with the ambient temperature and not so much the overall, like, large enclosure. Um, the large enclosure can kind of throw them off, and especially if you're, like, hovering over them and you're all of a sudden in this huge glass open area. Um, mm -hmm. But the ambient temperature, you know, typically if somebody has a 40-gallon, even if they have, like, a hot spot that's, you know, uh, good, they're probably keeping it in their house. And some people keep their house pretty cool. They might keep their house around 70 degrees. And they're coming from somewhere where like the ambient temperature in my room is more like 80 degrees. Um, and so just that whole drop, that 10, 12 degree drop that they might have in that air temperature can kind of set them off instinctively to, you know, want to refuse meals, uh, which makes sense. I mean, because cooler air temperatures are probably going to trigger them that way in the wild too. You know, hot summer days, probably eating a lot, you know, earlier in the summer and later in the summer, where they're from, especially in the northern region, you know, they can get pretty big temperature fluctuations. And if a front comes in and low pressure comes in and like a, like a storm comes in and low temperatures and all that, and just that overall cool temp, like the air temp, they probably a lot of them in the wild probably aren't looking to eat at that time. They're probably just looking to go more into, um, you know, grass clumps and abandoned road burrows and burying themselves until it's, you know, better temperatures come out and eat stuff and everything. And how, uh, just one more piece before, uh, we move on, but how, so if you offer food to a, to a baby and then 
It it refuses. How soon do you offer again? Um, you, yeah, that's a good question. I've actually had the uh, um, Hoggos refuse a meal, and then I go back four hours later and offer it and gotten them to eat. Now, that's not common. Um, but with babies, um, for me, I have so many. And I'll kind of thaw. I'll, I'll do like a, like I, I won't thaw for the entire room all in one day. This is usually like a two day process. And so I have like six hundred babies right here. And so with six hundred, I'd usually thaw three or four hundred. I go through three or four racks. And so whichever ones don't eat, you know, they'll get like marks. Like you might see a couple like, but I can't see them. But I got some like highlighter tag <laughs> back there. Yeah, it's way too small. Zoom in there. Um, and I'll put those for the ones that are less likely to. Yeah, you still can't see it. Um, your eyesight's really good. And yeah, I just kind of tag those and just kind of keep them in mind. And it's like, okay, I'll go back through and offer this one. Or maybe I'll offer that one live or try to go back to sending them. And that's another thing that too, because like, you know, you learn so much and you develop over the years and you know, you never know everything. Um, and that's the cool thing about hog nodes. They're not really straightforward. They're kind of quirky. You find a, there's a lot of little interesting things to them. Um, kind of like the hibernating and getting and brumating and getting them to eat out of brumation. Um, I'm sure that would actually work with other species as well. Um, but, you know, it's just not something that you really hear too many uh, people talk about. But with the, the hog nose, yeah, I mean, I try like every two, three days. I mean, if they refuse and you could always like scent. I, some people don't like scenting though because they think, oh, if I scent, they're going to get uh, addicted to it. They want to be on it for a while, which really isn't the case um, for hog nose. Usually like the best thing when I give them live, um, there's a few, a small percentage that continuously, they're, that's all they want to eat. Most of them, though, you get their, you know, metabolism going and they're growing more and they start getting more and more aggressive towards uh, feeding because they're getting the hang of it. And then you can usually introduce like a frozen thawed. Um, I've, I had one. It was a total bitch. Wouldn't eat anything. Um, start getting to eat live. After three live meals, now the thing just like grabs your frozen thawed like aggressively. That's kind of the neat thing about hog nose. Um, most of them switch pretty pretty quickly, but I have had some that take like I had a couple of females, and it's a you know only a couple out of a few hundred. I've had it especially with males too. It's a little more common with males, but uh, ones that were just like finicky feeders and just eat sporadically, um, and then after about 12, 14 months, they just start eating, you know, on the regular. Like I had a female that did that as an exanticonda. Had albino female and she's really pretty and i almost sold her but i was like well, i need to keep back more of these and i didn't want to sell her kind of anyway because she was kind of a pro problematic feeder and she wasn't too pretty she was just real sporadic she'd eat like twice a month and uh if you gave her live she'd eat but then i'll she was just a really defensive hog nose so it's kind of tough to feed her because she was always in defense mode you know she's just every time you go in there she'd just start hissing flying around you know with musking flopping on her back spiraling like you know extremely uh, defensive um, uh, behavior. And after about 12, 14 months, she would calm down a little more. And now she eats very well. And now she doesn't even refuse a meal. So that's kind of a trick with some of them too, is just kind of sticking with it. Um, and it's a small percentage that are like that. And it's definitely not a reason to get discouraged because especially if you have multiples, just like, like all right, you find out that one's feeding habits and they actually can fast for a long time. They're very good at keeping their body weight. Um, those problematic, problematic feeders, like the baby, you can always cool them. I've actually had that success with adults. I bought a lavender hog nose um, from this guy, a friend of mine, and it, for him, great feeder. Got into my setup, kept it exactly the same way pretty much. Don't know what it was. Didn't like my setup, though, and my air temperatures, whatever, wouldn't eat. And, um, you know, wouldn't eat for months. And he was near breeding size, so I was like, no, I'm just going to cool. Brought him out of cool down, you know, great feeder afterwards. So when you're cooling down your hog nose, what temperature are you getting them down to? Uh, good question. Um, it can vary. Um, because I have that Clark Smith a lot. Like, Why? What temperature do you cool them down to? Um, and I think that one is extremely variable. Because again, for where hog nose come from, you know, or in the northern region, even in Texas, you know, you'll get Texas uh, winters in like say the Lubbock area and even Midland. I mean, it could be like seventy degrees, and then you know, you know, that could be like three degrees, and it can mm. be even temperatures are like in the teens, and then it's like snowing and flurries, and then like you know. A week later, it's like 70 degrees, and maybe there's a tornado warning. Um, and then, like, in their northern range, you know, like the Dakotas and, like, Montana and Wyoming, you know, everybody up there, they know those temperatures are wild. Nebraska, you know, you can get those fronts moving in and out. And um, 
their lows in the, the winter up there, you know, can be like negative 30 degrees and sometimes uh, worse, but they'll go deep down into um, abandoned rodent burrows that they re-excavate out. And they've actually found that they, a lot of them hibernate together, um, that they'll mm -hmm. be as many as eight or 10 in the same spot. And they like to utilize um, the same rodent burrows. And it seems like those abandoned rodent burrows too that they use um, for uh, hibernation and everything are the same exact ones that they'll continue to go to. So they kind of have their spots that they'll kind of co-hibernate in. And it kind of seems similar to garter snakes. But with that being said, you go down deep into the ground, the average temperature is like in the, you know, like probably in the mid 50s. So I think the perfect um, cool down temp is anywhere between like 50 and like 62. And I've actually cooled them right. um, before where I've gotten down into the high 30s. Um, it's not necessary. Um, it certainly isn't going to hurt your snakes. Uh, as long as they're healthy. If you have a hog nose that had some maybe issues with like respiratory issues or had any underlying health problems, I would do probably a more stable and shorter cool down period. But for a healthy hog nose, I mean, you can cool them for long periods of time. I mean, in the wild, they, they, they'll go into hibernation uh, and they go down to those, you know, hibernaculums for five, six months sometimes. Um, especially in the wow. northern. Yeah, yeah, you're looking at more like probably five months for a lot of them. And but I've cooled them as warm as like 65, 66 degrees. And I've had pretty good luck with that. And the key to also is keeping them dark during that time as well. Um, so I just kind of yeah. keep them dark, make sure they stay hydrated. Um, and I started cooling. The one thing I started doing, I, I want to start doing YouTube videos and actually there's a lot of things to cover with Western hog. Um, yeah. It's like, well, you can hibernate them, but like, what do you hibernate them on? Most people hibernate them on aspen chips and that's fine. Um, but I like actually like to do a mix of like cocoa coir and sand and um you can even sometimes incorporate builder clay um if you have it but just coco coir is good because you're keeping the soil kind of moist and then that way if you have them in the mid 50s and they're down in that moist soil that's not too wet because you don't want like stopping wet you want to kind of like potting soil dampness or you know what you if you dug up and you went into some loose soil in the ground um in the fall you know put down the ground you know that kind of moisture that's kind of the moisture level you want in your structure because in the wild, when they're hibernating for five, six months, they're not drinking. Mm. Um, they're down in that um, cool soil. Their metabolism's real slow, not losing much, much moisture through respiration um, because they're in a moist environment as it is. And they're almost kind of like in like a moist, um, loamy soil cocoon. And they're probably absorbing some liquid or some water through their skin um, or at least not losing any. They're not able to lose any um, that way. And so I've actually hibernated them before, like for like three months, and I offer them water, and they're like not thirsty. But if you do them yeah. on acid chips, you got to make sure they stay hydrated because it's dry, and you don't want right. moist acid chips, obviously, because it's going to get pretty damn gross. Probably going to get yeah. mold in there and everything. Cocoa coir doesn't really mold; it has natural mold inhibitors, um, unless there's some type of um, like nit nitrate or in there, something like, like snake shit. But you're not cooling them down in shit. You know, you put them, you yeah. always put something brand new. Like when I cool. Them, I, I always make sure, you know, for one, you got to make sure their stomachs are empty. Like they haven't yeah. eaten for like about three weeks. And a lot of times I'll stage them. I'll kind of take them to an area where it's like slightly cooler and maybe cover them up, keep them slightly dark, and then kind of put them down to the, the full temperature. But I also don't see much of a problem kind of putting them right into full hibernation because like my friend Dan Eby, he lives in Montana. And um, we'll talk about the wild habit, uh, you know, habits of like hognose. And he'll be like, yeah, man, I was out finding bull snakes in Western hognose. And it was like, you know, it's like, early October and he's like, it's like 75 degrees. And then like two weeks later, it's like snowing and like 30 degrees with a low of 20. And yeah. that fall, you know, weather's pretty much going right from fall to winter. Cause that's the thing where they come from the fall and winter, it can happen pretty quickly. Yeah. Pretty quick transition for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're keeping them down for about three months, you said? Yeah. Like three months is a good, um, you know, sometimes like, more like two, two and a half months is like more common for me, especially if you're like doing babies that you're trying to get feeding. It's not necessary to do a real extended period of time. I don't think they really have much um, concept of time because I've cooled them like a month and a half, two months with pretty good success. But you do want like they do like if you do them too short, it, there can be um, um, some lack of follow through. I follow like people with briefs. I've heard people like oh, I cooled mine fully for like five weeks and you know i'm having this kind of issue i'm like well five weeks is like not a really long period of time and so for them i mean a hog knows five weeks in the wild i mean they can get terrible crappy ass weather in april or may for a few weeks so 
five mm -hmm. weeks. So you really want to go at least like two months. Um, when I have cooled babies that I'm feeding, I found that even cooling them for like three, four weeks is good enough though. But when it comes to breeding and getting good fertility, it seems like you really want to go about two months. Cool. You can go longer too. You can go longer too because I've actually cooled them as long as five months. Um, and you don't really see any weight loss or any issues with that. Months. That's a long time. Five months. Man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So a couple quick things before we jump on the next topic. Um, first off, everything you just said, for somebody who doesn't know much, much about hog nose, you just scared the shit out of him with this whole heat feeding. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it not that bad. You don't have that many animals that start out that badly. I mean, it's a very, very, very low percentage yeah, of babies. That you have right. Going back to the feeding, like the ones that I have, well, let's see, the thing is the one year I hatched out, like this past season wasn't my best season. The season before, though, I had like 1,200 babies. And wow. when I hibernate the uh, difficult feeders. For one, I have a lot of babies and a, a lot of things going on. So for the ones that are be, being extremely difficult for me, the ones that will cool to, um, you know, st stimulate the whole kind of spring, you know, time progress and getting them to uh, getting them to uh, want to like naturally feed. Um, it's a very small percentage. Um, ones where I go to cool them down, I'd say it's about three percent of my babies. Um, and that was only the year I produced twelve hundred. This past year. Um, with all these babies behind me, I didn't cool a single one, actually. Yeah. So, well, in all honesty, I mean, when it comes out of this, and, you know, we only hear the horror stories online. Like, nobody ever goes on Facebook and says, wow, what a great feeding hog nose I have. It's when you have somebody having yeah, an issue true. that they're going to bring it up publicly. Right. And, you yeah, know, a lot of that really comes down to the breeder. You know, somebody like Junior, who's putting the time in, making sure the animal is well started, has a good feeding schedule not just producing animals and sending them out to send them out to get money in. Um, so, you know, hog nose be really great. And, you know, Benjamin and Ryan, you know, your interest in peaked in the beginning and then he might've lost you a little bit there, but, um, no, not you at know, all. with our hog nose and the skinks and the corn snakes, they all have the same cool down schedule. They're all in the same room. They're all the exact same temperatures and they all come up at the same time. So we get our about two months in with all three of those species. And we discussed last time, you know, it's okay to work a lot of different species as long as you have similar settings. Yep. So, you know, having hog nose in your skink room, let's say, is not a bad thing because they all, they all can cycle the exact same time. The only thing that we found while doing this is when they all come out of cooling, where the skinks jump right into breeding, the hog nose took at least a month to a month and a half after to come out of cool down before we actually had good lots. Okay. Yeah. One thing like what Dave was saying about like keeping like different species, like that's actually the cool thing about hognose. So I've actually had ball python breeders show interest in um, Western hognose. And they're like, well, I think my rooms might be too hot. Like my ambient temperature is like 83. I'm like, actually, that's good. Um, that's not a problem. And the thing is you can actually keep hognose too in rooms with cooler ambient temperatures. They just kind of have to adjust. Uh, and again, it's like when I said, like sometimes you'll have babies go off feed and it's because you're moving them to a completely new environment. Um, and it's a small percentage again, too. We're talking about the small percentage, like days. I'm like, um, you know, like this year so far, I've shipped um, from January till now. I don't even know how many. I mean, I've done a lot. I've probably shipped out over 100 Western hognose since then. And I've had practically zero complaints. Um, and not even complaints, you know, there's a few every now and then I'll have people like, hey, you know, he's missed a few feedings. And I'll give them like some tips and everything. And generally, they all go back to feeding. And um, then I'll get people that ask me questions too. Like, I had a few people, they're like, they want to buy hog nose from me. And I'm like, well, the cheapest ones I have right now are around $200. And then, like, three weeks later, like, hey, I bought this hog nose from this guy. And I don't have his information. won't eat from me. What do I do? Okay. <laughs> and so I'm like, all right, well, these are some things to do. And uh, I just kind of send them that information and uh, give them the ideas. But yeah, like, like the thing, well, the one thing that people don't talk about with hog nose um, is actually how good of feeders they are. Because again, once you get them feeding and they get the ball rolling, um, these things are extremely um, aggressive feeders and very consistent feeders. Um, you know, like pretty much all these racks behind me, um, I only have the tagged colored ones or they're kind of like the um, finicky feeders. And out of the 600, there's probably about 40. Um, and the thing is, again, they can go a while without eating. So it's pretty easy to, you know, uh, work with them and not get like, you know, if they don't eat for like two weeks, it's not an issue. You know, it's like, okay, we got some time. Um, mm -hmm. And my dad, he, my dad bred corn snakes. Um, uh, I never really messed with corn snakes too much, but um, Dave actually, my Dave bought parts of my dad's collection when my dad was getting out of uh, breeding corn snakes. But my dad started breeding corn snakes around the time I was like 15. 
and he wanted like kind of a project that he did on his own because we brought geckos together. I did hongos, you know, um, does all my stuff. And then he wanted to get into corn snakes and um, he seen some uh, opportunity with like the, these pink snow corns. Um, and there's this guy who was selling with the reptile show. Can't uh, remember exactly who he was, but my dad got them and uh, started line breeding them. And he had other uh, morphs too, like the terrazzo corn snake, which was originally named granite, but they called the anery um, blood red. Uh, granite so he actually changed the name because that gene almost got lost and he's luckily able to acquire them but he bred corns and he would actually always say he goes, man i wish my baby corns would feed as good as your hog nose snakes because baby corns are you know there's a percentage of them that are poor feeders and um hog nose again once you get them feeding i'd say about 90 percent of your babies are extremely uh strong feeders and are very easy to get them feeding but so far like yeah we've pretty much been just talking about um just uh um more you know difficult like the kind of like uh you know um troubleshooting like you know your ones that are more finicky but again like for me it's a very small percentage i'd say you know right off the bat 90 percent are pretty strong feeders by the time they're all four or five months old about 97 98 percent of them are extremely good feeders not giving me any issue so one last thing before we jump into the next topic um when are you going to change the battery in your fire alarm in your room? Because this beeping is driving me crazy. <laughs> oh, yeah. That started happening like two days ago, and it's kind of been my uh, going to be my new incubator room. And there's no power or anything in there. And if there was ever a fire, I don't know why there'd ever be a fire in there. There's nothing um, in there that. That's your come. excuse for not changing it. <laughs> yeah, it's been going for a past few days. But see, the thing I'm not really even over there. It's kind of like through the other side door. I kind of for I keep forgetting about it. <laughs> We're yeah. not. Yeah, it's definitely oh, it absolutely bad? deafening. Is it that bad? <laughs> oh, it's bad. It but like half the time, really? I'm just waiting to hear it again. I'm not even listening to you talk right now. Really? You're just counting the beep. No, no, I'm listening to you. That was a lie. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna try to move it away from it then. Yeah, <laughs> it'll help maybe slightly. Yeah, we can only yeah. hope. We we uh so when you're when you're talking about that um about the uh feeding and things like that it got me thinking about some other uh snakes that we have that are tricky eaters um an oddball maybe that we probably uh it's just something in my mind i would love to try to uh to scent some pinks for our um for our anthills the pygmy pythons okay they don't, they don't eat uh they don't th normally in the wild they eat baby knobtail geckos you know and okay. we can't we can't they afford have, they have it like termite mounds don't they yeah yep yep so we're like they they don't they're really tricky to get started and sometimes you know we have to force feed for like a while and justin julander is like the pygmy python guy and he's like yeah you know if you force feed it should only be for a few months and we force fed for like eight months the last clutch that we had and uh we're slowly getting better at it, but I think that I think there's something to that. Maybe uh, <laughs> scenting, <laughs> maybe maybe scenting like you're saying with and uh, and braining the uh, pinks. That um, you know what? Work. Yeah, because uh, my dad never really did anything like that. But every now and then, you know, he'd go somewhere, he'd go on vacation for like like a month, and be like, hey, can you take care of my corn snakes? And usually, his one friend would come over, he'd pay him, and. But, you know, I, I would help sometimes. And he had this one group of finicky feeders. Um, and he's like, oh, he goes, I forget what he said. He goes, he goes those ones aren't going to eat. And I tried all my hog nose tricks on them. And they pretty much all ate every single one. Wow. So, yeah. And, well, corn snakes are actually lizard feeders a lot. So very similar diet. Um, and, yeah, you're talking about your animals being lizard feeders. Um, just because they're lizard feeders, kind of like hog nose. Hog nose actually eat lizard eggs. And they're also lizard feeders as well. Um, they found adults eating, you know, like, uh, horn toads. Um, you know, if they can, if they can get a hold of them, ground skanks, you know, and stuff, they'll eat them. Typically you're, they're not getting a hold of them though. Cause they're pretty quick and hog nose are kind of more clumsy, slower feeders. And they're usually using a rostral scale to dig up, uh, prey and all that. But I would actually try to sardine juice. Um, yeah. even though it's not something they eat and you could try to water trick too, because you put that up to the tip of their mouth and you get them to drink a little bit, you know, just take their water away for a little bit. So they're a little thirsty. And, um, you know, that worked for my dad's corns really well. Um, and, um, hmm. see the reason I, you know, it works real well for hog noses, hog noses aren't ambush predators. They kind of just dig up food or they come across food 
Um, and he kind of pushed her face into it and they grab it. They used their rear fangs to hang on to it and subdue it. Um, you know, then when they're eating like turtle eggs or lizard eggs, that ain't getting away. So that's pretty easy to eat. But, um, you know, definitely scenting something like amphibians or even sardine juice might uh, actually help. Uh, and it could actually stimulate their appetite. Huh. We have a, a Mullendorfi, the 100 flower rat snake, uh, one that's not eating well and not eating at all, actually, at the moment. Yeah, it's being a pain in my behind. So, yeah. And those are also, I mean, they'll eat lizards, right? Hmm. Will they? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anything about them in the wild. I. <laughs> they probably, they probably, it seems like a lot of rat snakes are. Um, yeah. You know, like stuff like corn snakes and like black rats. I mean, they'll eat, you know, bird eggs. So, you know, black rat snake, I mean, even a big one, they'll show like a six footer going up into a tree and they'll raid, you know, like a nest and, uh, you know, eat all the eggs, even though, I mean, eating mm -hmm. like rat eggs for black rat, I mean, it doesn't seem like a large meal, but, you know, I go through and eat enough uh, bird eggs, but. Um, you know, and their diet is uh, pretty diverse, but you know, that's what too with anthros. I mean, they're primarily eating lizards. Um, so I mean, it seems like any type of like lizard feeder, um, definitely has some difficulty switching over to pinks. I mean, and seeing with hog nose, they're typically amphibian feeders, um, and then also egg eaters and um, uh, lizard eaters, um, on the occasion. Um, so just trying different scenting techniques and things that stimulate their appetite. I mean, sardine juice is such a strong, um, overpowering, like, you know, scent, you know, and taste. And, you know, that could possibly work on right. it. That is how you get tigers to eat your husband. Wow. Yeah, that's true. Wow. Yeah. Sardine juice? Oh, yeah, yeah. Although I use sardines in spring water. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good thing. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Dave's seen that. I know Dave liked it. I, I was about to watch it. And my girlfriend was like, uh, I don't know. And she's like, and I was like, oh, okay. And then Dave, like the day later, he's like, man, you gotta watch this show. It's called Tiger King. I was like, I was about to watch that. <laughs> so then I put it on and she was into the, uh, I, of course I was too. I'm like, man, this is pretty, uh, fascinating stuff. Um, pretty interesting. And I, I could talk about that for hours. There was just so many aspects of that and so many, you know, points of views from both sides and I can see both. Um, but yeah, it was pretty, uh, the big cat. Um, I could, I actually had a couple people, um, asks me, they're like, hey, do you know? I was like, I don't know that. I've never heard of them. I was like, there's really not much crossover with the big cat exotic keepers and a re reptile people. Um, I mean, breeding hognose is pretty uh, pretty easy, and it's a pretty easy species to keep, and uh, it's pretty easy to keep happy. You know, they just need shelter, water, you know, food, and, you know, good areas to burrow. <laughs> cats that could possibly maul you. They have big, big difference. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit a little bit yeah <laughs> yeah we tried talking about this with bob last week and we just didn't get a whole lot of bob with that show i'm not even convinced he really watched it i think everything that he knew was based on what he saw on facebook oh yeah. really he wouldn't, he wouldn't come out and admit that he didn't watch it he's just like kind of like one of those kids like in the like at school and they're like hey did you read the book and he's like yeah and you're listening to the other kids because actually i got <laughs> i remember doing that I, like, I didn't read the whole book and um the other kids i did not do well in school it was not my uh, <laughs> in my place for yeah the, being I educated, educated myself on my own or when I got out of school. But um, yeah, I was yeah I was just listened to what they said about the book and it could have been just kind of put together the pieces of the story because they talk about the important facts and they'd be like, well, why do you think this person did that? And I'm like, well, from what this kid said and based on logic, this is what they would do, and they're very good. <laughs> yeah, Bob probably did. All right, what was Bob saying? He just wasn't, or maybe wasn't. Not a whole lot. That was the problem. Was, I don't, I don't, it was not rememberable. I don't remember a single thing about that conversation. Ben looked all it, excited about it, and Bob brought nothing to the table. We tried to bring it up. He was just like, yeah, I didn't watch it. Yeah. Like, I, yeah. All of I think America he said he watched, watched it, it, but he just didn't seem like, he seemed like he was bullshitting. Yeah. Are you going further away? It's not going to change it, Junior. You got you to get in a whole other building for us not to hear that sound anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I wish I had like a foam board. I actually, if I went into the other room, yeah, I wish I would have known earlier. If I went into the other room, it'd probably be a lot, um, it'd be dulled out a lot more. That's fine. Maybe there'll be a next time just because I want to see if you change the battery out. Okay. <laughs> probably just take yeah. it out. Yeah. <laughs> That's not very safe. You should just change well, that room again, man. That room, there's nothing like all the the smoke alarms. They, you know, they have a purpose for pretty much every room, and the the whole facility. <laughs> so for the incubator room again, it's not even functioning right now. It's having been done. 
there's nothing in that room. You're not, there's like an electrical outlet. A fire could not start in there. <laughs> I mean, do you need me to call your mom? I'm going to call your mom and tell her to come over and change the battery out. Unless somebody committed arson and threw like a Molotov cocktail and they knew right where my incubator room is, then I would not know until it spread to the other rooms. <laughs> uh, Good so, uh, luck which one's the incubator room, though. <laughs> very small. If you're trying to commit arson and you don't know the layout, it's going to be very difficult to find that room. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a bet. <laughs> Let's find it. Uh, so you're doing this full time, right? This is your full time. Yeah, yeah, I do this, yeah, this full time. Um, yeah, geckos, hognose snakes. Still breed a lot of leopard geckos. Um, my dad um, and I bred leopard and fat tail geckos, and then we had our side projects. And I, I, was, I actually I bred hognose and fry bred geckos, and he got out of it completely around like seven years ago. He still had a few corn snakes for a little while afterwards. Um, but uh, yeah, then he parted with his corn snakes, and he kind of does his art and all that stuff. And um, I kind of just took the rest of the geckos and, um, you know, continued on with that. Um, and actually I reduced on geckos for a little while and, but I'm back up with, uh, producing a decent number of leopard and fat tail geckos. But my prime, uh, interest in everything is Western hoggos. And that's where my main focus and most of my breeding is done with them. But leopard and fat tail so, geckos, I still love them and they sell well and, you know, everything. So I still work with them. So, um, how old were you the last time you had a normal job? Or a non-reptilian full-time job. Twenty. Twenty. Yeah, you're man. Yeah. Well, yeah. I just kind of like, um, uh, you know, the the one thing that I think fuels a lot of reptile breeders is the passion and the species they like, and then also, especially when you're first thing, you gotta be frugal as hell, and that's what I was. You know, you gotta basically, you know. That means living with your parents. And if you want to breed reptiles, do that. You know, if you're not, if you have to have like. Uh, set up to impress people or you want to be out on your own um, you might have to wait a little while longer um, until you're ready to be a full-time reptile breeder or you might start 31 31 years old or 32 years old 30 30 is the 30. number well you, you all know i have underlying health conditions and actually wait because i almost uh bought a place when i was 23 and that actually would have probably worked out at the time i didn't have really good credit built up but this actually all came together pretty well. I almost bought a place uh, almost two years ago, and this place was ended up being really ideal. It's uh, commercial and residential, um, so I cannot have anybody complain about what I'm doing here. Um, and yeah, and it's pretty much a really good setup uh, for reptiles as far as having a bunch of different rooms and everything. It's got a pretty good layout, um, able to customize a lot of the stuff. And yeah, and when you're breeding reptiles, you definitely got to put the reptiles before you and your comfortability. So again, yeah, like Dave said, if that means the living in your house and being yelled at your parents until you're 31, that's the way to go. It's the way to go. You got to treat yourself like shit and the reptiles like, you know, <laughs> number one. So uh, there's a lot of people in this hobby that have aspirations to do this full time. And, and you guys have both been doing this full time for a, a while now. You have any good tips for these guys to what they should maybe think about or do to kind of help them out aside yeah, from I, living with their parents, aside from living with their parents. Wait, keep living costs low, keep living costs low. And then also I think a lot of people I've seen and or Dave might agree with this too. I'll have his input afterwards, but uh, just the, the, the fear of having to go back to a normal job to um, be the driving motivation to get all of your stuff done and oh to be responding to customers all the time. And just having that nagging fear that you might fall into the pit of having to go back to doing drywall finishing and, um, you know, just being in a despair of having to go back to that old lifestyle. I like that. That's a good tip. <laughs> yeah, fear. Lance, it's all Lance fear. 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 It's all fear. Yeah, it's all fear. Put up, yeah, but like you're – find some coworkers that you really hated or <laughs> your uh, boss – or even the work environment and just take pictures of that and put that on your wall and have that every morning. Right on reverse inspirational posters. I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. Reverse inspiration and then have a list of things you got to get done, you know, with the reptiles and everything. Um, but it, one of the big thing too is patience. You gotta be very patient because there really isn't a quick species where it's going to be like, oh, all of a sudden you're going to be full time. So that's the one thing I get people like, Oh, can I do this full time? And it's kind of a question I don't really like cause I kind of want people to be long-term hobbyists and kind of grow. And then you grow into that and you get that idea on your own right away. 
definitely don't want to be that. Yeah, the, the first motivation to want to get into reptile is like, okay, this is my key focus is to be full time. Because like any full time um, job or any full time like business hobby uh, combination, you're going to have a lot of other people that want to do that. And um, there's competition. And, um, you know, it could be a drive for, I mean, it hurt the leopard gecko market for a good bit. I know in like the later 2000s, um, there were so many new leopard gecko breeders coming up because it's pretty easy to have fast turnover. You have females you know, that are 10, 12 months old, 14 months old that will lay, you know, 10, 20 eggs sometimes a season. You know, you have a really good diet and you're, you have a real, you know, productive female. She might lay 10 sets of two eggs. So you might get 20 eggs. And, um, you know, there was so many, I remember on gecko forums, there was uh, ads for, breeders and there was that big boom in europe and interest in like started picking up in hong kong um with uh you know people wanting to get a leopard geckos because all the new morphs that were on the market in like the mid 2000s so this is more around like 2005 2006 and the market was very strong and then around 2007 2008 there were so many people that were buying these things and then they all they're breeding leopard geckos for like a year year and a half and they'd have a website already and they'd be having a bunch of leopard geckos posted for sale and um it wasn't too hard to adapt to that because um, it did hurt sales a little bit, but we just did so many reptile shows and you do wholesale orders and then your sales online. And there's just so many things you're running around doing. And that was the thing about leopard geckos too, doing those kind of full time. That's like, that's a, that's a job in itself. Just to sit, you know, you gotta be out there uh, kind of marketing, putting things on different classifieds, going to, you know, post down forums. Um, you know, Morph Market wasn't around then, but you know, doing things like King Snake, and then having a website and then just doing shows constantly. Hmm. So um, I wish we had more time, by the way. We're going down like the last eight, nine, ten minutes of this. Yeah, but, we can um, go as long as you want, really. We might have to go a little bit longer on this. Until, we'll go you know, longer. I think I, kind of, I feel like I ruined it by talking about species I don't work with for a whole hour. <laughs> I'm probably just can't agree with this now. But even at the beginning, I'm like, I'm like, man, I'm not speaking as articulately as I typically do. Probably a little nervous because it's a podcast and everything, but now I'm, I'm more comfortable and we can stop talking about bones, pythons, and other stuff. That <laughs> Again, I honestly think that bones conversation was one of the highlights. Not to be rude because I love everything you always say, but I really thoroughly enjoyed that conversation. Yep. Okay. But, well, I think it was a good conversation. I just kind of feel like I don't really have much of a position to talk about the species I haven't worked with. Um, that was probably the best conversation I've ever had on the species between the four of us talking. Tell you we have four of the top minds in the industry right now talking yeah. about the species. Yeah, now. something like that. What do we say yeah. about this show? No fucking egos. <laughs> he was but, talking about um, me. I mean, top mind. So talking a couple numbers, and then we have to talk at least a little bit about fat tails. Um, what? Okay. Your best year breeding leopard geckos, how many babies did you guys have? Oh, man. Yeah, okay. That's like one of my um, – yeah, that's one actually kind of closer to the end. My dad would get like – he'd be like, he goes, we breeded this, this, this many again. I don't want to do this shit. This is horrible. <laughs> because I was kind of like, you know, the general – like kind of like the breeding force. Like, you know, we'd go back and forth. Like, what should we breed together? But ultimately in the end, he'd be like, you pick most of the projects and things we should do. You know, and I'd be like, we should keep this back and everything. And I always uh, was aspiring to grow more and more. And it did get to a point where it's like, all right, you kind of capped out. You need to knock it off. And that was like around 5,000. We produced 5,000 in a year. Um, a but actually, I had, um, you know, I had a lot of repeat customers and people that would want to buy one to 200 at a time um, to resell and stuff. And sometimes I'd sell to pet stores. Um, and, and we did a lot of reptile shows. I mean, back then, I mean, we did so many shows. We would do. Like I, the most we did, and this is with local shows too. So if you count those, you know, but we want to do like the Cleveland show in the summer. So we would do about nine or 10 of those a year. Um, and then we do sometimes a Columbus show. We would do sometimes a show. We do Tinley, obviously. Um, when NARBC had the Philadelphia show, we did that. And then we do Hamburg. We do Daytona. Sometimes I go out to Texas um, by myself. And then sometimes my, my dad would go to California or I go to Pomona. We didn't do those too often. And we do shows in Tennessee, or no, no, we didn't do Tennessee. We did um, North Carolina, South Carolina, and we we did a couple others. But we do like sometimes up to like thirty-two shows a year. Wow! And it's, yeah, it's the thing with leopard geckos. It's like you have a lot of them. Um, you have to you do a lot of online sales, and it's a lot of work um, because leopard geckos are easy to produce. Um, now the hard part is you know making that profitable, and then also 
selling to, you know, responsible like keepers and everything. And, um, you know, making sure you have like, you know, enough room to put all this stuff. And, you know, so it's very difficult because, you know, you got to have the rack set up a uh, very large um, insect bill. You know, you're looking at like $35,000 a year to feed all these um, when we're up to that many. But, you know, typically we're producing more around like 2,500. Um, and that was a more comfortable number. Okay. Um, I just thought I was going to say, and like, you know, that 32 number you said, it sounds like a really scary number, but it's not really 32 weekends on the road because like you said the Cleveland and Columbus shows the same weekend. So 10 of yeah, those actually, weekends, you're doing two shows at a time. Right. I'm actually talking about doing a lot of shows. I'm talking to the show King right here. Dave does a lot of shows and he's traveling, he's traveling a lot more. Um, my strategy for doing shows was doing as many shows back then that were pretty close. Dave um, does a lot of shows and you do shows that are like relatively close, but you definitely don't mind trucking pretty far. Like I, you're always going to different spots. Um, an extra four or five hours in the car doesn't seem like that big of a deal, honestly. I mean, you're really only talking like an extra tank of gas maybe. And you know, your expenses aren't that much more to drive an extra four or five hours. If the show's going to be good. Um, so you're right. You know, we put miles in over the years and you put in a lot, but um, you know, it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah, then we also did the, the ham show too. Because when we did the ham show, we wouldn't only deliver animals; we'd actually vend show or uh, vend the show too, and set up the table. So when you do the overseas shows, I mean, is it less talk behind the table? Is it more people coming over and just pointing at an animal and taking it, or how does that work? In, in Japan, yes, Japan was actually awesome. Uh, there is this. He's he's like like almost twenty now, um, and I haven't talked to him too much recently. But his name is uh, Yutaro, and. Um, this kid was cool. He was like, um, I don't know at the time, he may have been like nine or 10. Um, he was a little older. Um, but um, he actually, I think he lived in London for like a few years, but he spoke perfect English and um, also Japanese. And then it's funny, I was asking him, I was like, um, are you going to learn it? He goes, yeah, I'm actually going to learn uh, uh, French. And he goes, because because he said in, uh, even in school in Japan, he goes, you got to take a language class. He goes, you could choose English. He goes, even he even choose Japanese, I guess, to get like, you know, uh, further in depth of like learning all the characters and everything. And he goes, oh, I chose French because that's a common uh, language along uh, across the uh, you know world. And uh, he would help translate for me. And it was awesome because I'd be like, tell, him, tell this person this, you know, joke around with them. And so his Japanese was like spot on. And uh, so same with his English. His English, like if you talk to him, you thought he's from the United States. And, uh, but before then, every now and then I'd have to ask a friend to come over um, and I'd be, hey, can you help translate this real quick? Um, but yeah, you had a lot less talk because um, yeah, a lot of Japanese people understand English uh, fairly well, but more in writing because they learn it like in high school. I think they take some courses. So reading English, they're pretty much all very capable of doing that. Um, a lot of Japanese people, um, understand a very small amount of English and it seemed like maybe 10% or less spoke pretty good English. Um, so a lot of them would be just kind of like look at stuff and um, every now and then they kind of like hand motion, like do a little lower on price. Um, and they'd ask some questions um, if they, you know, knew the right words and everything. And then I try to explain. And if they really need a translator, I'd have somebody come over. But overall, yeah, there wasn't uh, as much talk. There was more people that, you know, handing me money for animals and stuff. I've and then I heard people over there speak English. Um, but yeah, a lot of countries too. You had people coming from like, you know, France, Italy, you know, um, you know, over in Belgium and, you know, Poland. And, uh, um, but, you know, most of the people spoke pretty decent English or enough to do a degree where you could carry out a simple conversation. Cool. Um, well, should we keep it simple until Ryan comes back? I mean. No, I, I want him to miss everything. Okay, you know, good. Serves him right. <laughs> yeah, right. You got anything, Ben? You want to throw out, or you want to you want to just um, jump right into fat tail geckos? Where you want to be? Um. Well, I there was a couple things. Uh, I have one thing that I want to close out with. Um. But uh, I had one more thing. I, I'm just starting to lose it. We can get into fat tails though as well. I know there's one thing that I do want to talk about as a closeout, but I'll save that one. So we can get Until into the fat tails. Yeah. 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 Not like last time where you. Had your closeout come? I think you asked the closeout question around like hour one of the interview. For some reason, <laughs> I remember, yeah, I, right? Yeah, I don't. I, you know, the first time jitters of us, you know, working together. <laughs> I guess I don't know, but uh, I get it. Bob's gorgeous. I was jittery the whole time myself. 
<laughs> yeah, it's funny. But, but yeah, um, no, we can get into fat tales. Uh, the the one so there is one question I guess I, I now remember was you. It's probably good to to talk about. We're still on leopard geckos. How many how many things are you uh, known for bringing to the market? Or I know that you've imported things as well, and um, maybe that you were like, I don't know if I, I don't know how many things you're maybe the the first person to have or the the real driver of things. How many things? Because I think sometimes people watch this and they're like. Oh, you know, like I've heard of, I've heard of Jeff and them, but I don't really know a lot. I, I want people to see a perspective of exactly how big of an influence you are and how big of a name you are actually in the leopard and hog nose world. I mean, uh, even though you're young, you're still like, you're a big deal. You've been in this for a long time, 18 years or more. And I mean, so can you just real quick talk about even with the hog nose and the leopard gecko? Yeah. What you what you've brought in to this to this market that people are like, oh man, you know, like, and you can even mention that uh, during that one Tinley auction uh, was it two years ago or October uh, two years ago, and we. Oh uh, wait, I don't know if we're allowed to talk about this, Gene. All right, yeah. never mind. <laughs> we could talk about it, um, but yeah, with the with the hog nose, um, I'm the originator of Arctic uh, Lemon Ghost and Woma. And the Woma came from my Lemon Ghost projects, though. I started getting Lemon Ghost and had these uh, kind of like triangle, almost like kind of sometimes tiger striping by their neck. And I started line breeding that. And so I originated Woma, um, Lemon Ghost. And actually, I have some pretty cool Woma stuff. I just don't really share it um, unless somebody's, you know, wanting to buy it. But I'm doing more stuff with that that people will probably see in a few years. Um, but then Arctics. So those three trades so with Hog Nose. I've also developed my own line of uh, Red Phase, but... I never really market it or even told, tell people. People kind of know it's like my line, but I've outcrossed it into other red lines too. And I've been working on that since the time I was 15. So I kind of have my own red phase lineage too. But the main uh, morph that kind of really are like, you know, originated in Hoggles, of course, the Arctic, Lemon Ghost, and Woma. Uh, Leopard Geckos, I, you know, did all that with my dad. So that's kind of like, you know, like a joint effort. Um, some people might even want to give him a little more credit for a lot of it because. Um, when I was young, obviously, I wasn't the main investor in all this. When I was 12 and 13 years old, I wasn't like, you know, balling with all kinds of money. And that's kind of how we got into leopard geckos. I was like, I was like, you know, going to shows and, um, you know, I talk about breeding more and more, and, you know, then my dad just kind of watched me struggle, like try to talk to these people to try to, you know, buy leopard geckos with my like measly 50 bucks. And, um, and so then when, uh, we started getting leopard geckos. I remember, I think it was, it was Robbie Hampers at the Hampers table. They had some high yellow leopard geckos and they were really interesting looking um, um, high yellow leopard geckos, these big, bold, black blocks. And they kind of had like this lime greenish look. And um, they came from originally a gourmet rodent and they were reselling them or breeding them from ones they got from them. And um, my, I told my dad, I was like, I really want to get these. And so we bought those. And it's funny, I've never seen those again, anything like that. And that was actually the founding stock for hyperxanthix. And we line bred hyperxanthix for about a decade um, until we got the look that we we're kind of going uh, for. And it was probably about seven or eight years when we kind of came out, but it was probably a full decade before they kind of like really achieved this um, unique look that was extremely different from anything else in the leopard gecko hobby. So we're known for hyperxanthix. And actually that's one we're probably the least known for. Um, and if for some reason that's like a really, um, underappreciated line bread trait. And it's actually extremely powerful, similar to that of Black Knight with the way it reacts and how strong. Because you can take a hyperxanthic and you can breed it to something. First generation, you're seeing a lot of hyperxanthic in there, a lot of hyperxanthic characteristics. And that can't be said for most um, line bred leopard gecko traits. Most line bred leopard gecko traits, you outbreed them to something completely different. A lot of that's lost first generation. Um, and then we're known for blood hypos, our own lineage of um, tangerine. And that started from, um, actually at the time, most people are going for super hypotangerines. Least amount of spots, brightest uh, coloration, bright yellow, bright oranges, and the most carrot tail. And we kind of seen everybody else was doing this. And we we're like, well, let's try to get as dark red as we can because red's cool, dark orange is cool. Um, and we found the ones that had more spots, which makes sense because they're producing more pigmentation or the better source to go to to line breeding a darker pigmentated animal and not line breeding out the spots because you're line breeding out a lot of pigmentation while doing that. Um, and so our hypo lineage, we went towards producing a dirtier, darker colored, more spotted animal. And so we originated bloods. Um, and then we had some other morphs that we created before other people did. 
um, you know, like radars. Um, then that was one that um, I really wanted to produce because Raptor is actually kind of an acronym. It's not a full acronym because the OR is for orange and that's not exactly how acronyms work, but it's close because you got Raptor. It's a red-eyed albino patternless trumper orange. And um, and that's uh, the, the thing is with Raptors though, they don't have to really be patternless. You know, people call them band Raptors, but you know, it's, it's all line bread. It's all line bread. Like, um, except for the clips and the trumper albino there. So everything aside from that's just line bread. So it's kind of just like, you know, if you have a raptor that has a reverse stripe or a bandit, it's still a raptor. It's not a raptor because it doesn't have the P, the patterns in it. <laughs> um, but radar, we're like, everybody's expecting an acronym. So we made the eclipse of albino. And so the albino is a different strain of different, you know, completely incompatible line of uh, albino. And we put eclipse into that. And for, we really wanted to make sure there's no Trump in it, though, because that's the thing. Leopard gecko people are very um, analytical about that stuff, and they really they, they really don't want the albino lines mixed together um, to avoid confusion when you're working on your projects. And so I wanted something that sounded close to Raptor, but you also get some people like, what's the acronym? You could ask, and I was like, I don't know. I, was, I can't think of an acronym that would sound cool and make sense. I was like, they got all red eyes, radar, seems to you know, make sense. And um and so aside from that, we have, then we had lavender stripes. Um, and that one's kind of like, we kind of had our own lavender stripe line. That one I wouldn't say is like anything like a real big accomplishment, but we actually did line breed for quite a while. And actually that project, I uh, kind of lost that one, but actually Steve Sykes still has stuff from original pure lavender stripes I've read and he's still keeping that going. And they look pretty good. And um, if you look at them, it's like, okay, that's definitely a different polygenetic from anything else that's out there. And I'm um, trying to think if we did anything else. I know we did other stuff with combination of leopard geckos, but I'm trying to think of actual leopard geckos that are distinct of ones we made. But I'll just move on to fat tails. Um, we're originators of the whiteout gene. It's an incomplete dominant gene. The homozygous, unfortunately, is lethal. There's no problem with the single incomplete, uh, you know, one copy gene carrier whiteouts. Whiteouts are extremely strong and they have absolutely zero issues. Uh, but the homozygous form is like kind of like a pinto, like, pied looking horse, like the, you know, like the pinto pied horses, mm -hmm. I think that's what they're called, but um, uh, they, they're like all white with like little blotches. And sometimes they'll be like pure white with like just a blue blotch in their head or just like a couple little panda blotches. Um, and they just die full term in egg. A lot of times their organs are outside. So we don't obviously be white out to white out. And we're also the first uh, people with patternless. Um, we bred the parent straight, although uh, Craig Stewart got um, a bigger group in of wild cocks and kind of beat us to the production on them. Um, and yeah, so we do, well, it doesn't really matter because it's like, well, who imported what? There's other, you know, ones that came in imported. But, um, so yeah, we're kind of known just for whiteouts and we're then doing fat tail combinations. First ones to make like whiteout Oreos, whiteout Zulus, whiteout Zulu caramels, um, you know, Oreo patternless, whiteout Oreo patternless, a lot of combinations. So we're kind of on the forefront of uh, producing fat tails. Um, and, uh, yeah, now like another good fat tail gecko breeder that's actually doing a lot of stuff with, uh, fat tails is, uh, Jessica from Gecko Babies, and she's actually got a lot of cool stuff now. Because I still breed quite a few fat tails. I have like uh, whiteout Zulus, um, a lot of uh, whiteout combinations, whiteout Oreos. I got a couple other interesting projects I'm working on that hopefully they come to fruition in a few years. Um, oh, and also we forgot uh, we originated granite fat tails and also zero fat tails and stinger fat tails, which are all line bred. So we originated those three, and as well as uh, our own line of the Barons. All right, so. I was just doing a quick math on that. So the, that was like four hog nose or so, uh, about five leopard gecko, and six is just what you mentioned from uh, from the fat tails. That's 15 things, 15 lines of animals that you guys like originated. I mean, yeah. I, mean I can't even get one. <laughs> you know, and most people listening will be like, oh, man, yeah, you know, like we're doing good. 15. It's pretty impressive. I mean, they also... They have their own lines of um for the corn snakes too with his father. Oh, yeah, that's my dad. Yeah, see, I can't take any credit for that. That's like all my dad. Yeah, my dad did the salmon snow and ghost corns, and he actually reinvigorated the whole ta terrazzo um gene because that's completely lost. Wow. Without my dad, there would be no terrazzo corn snakes right now. Wow, that's pretty awesome. See, and so I I just want people to see if you're listening and you made it through the two hours so far. If you're listening. Just realize what we what we're what we're talking about here and who we're talking to. I mean, it's just impressive. So, yeah. uh, Dave, you can go on. I my last thing, you know, I can close with is is you know, on the fun. Oh, side. I don't know. Um, can can we see a really nice um, lemon ghost? Doesn't have to be the best, but I've always really loved your lemon ghost stuff. 
Yeah, I got one over here that luckily just shut up. You know, when they're younger, they're not the they're not the best looking. Um, they got an older while, one. They take a while to color up. Um, well, I got one that shut out, and it's actually from a really good bloodline, and it actually just shows you uh, kind of the power of the lemon ghost because this isn't even a one hundred percent pure lemon ghost. This is a lemon ghost, uh, and it's it's actually um, pas het for something, and it's a project I'm working on. And I took um, a lemon ghost that was one of my best lemon ghosts, bred it to this trait, and I made lemon ghost crosses het for this trait, and I bred one of those now back to one of my best lemon ghosts. So this is seventy five percent. Uh, high quality lemon ghost lineage and 50% pass up for another trait. And um, it's like neon yellow, pretty much. I don't know if it'll show on the camera. It's a very tough color to pick up, even yeah, um, when I was. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it looks good. Some of the other, well, you have some really good pictures too, and you know, when. Um, ben goes to do some editing. I know we're going to put some pictures next to you as you're talking, but um, yeah, there were some of those that I remember back in the day were just absolutely like neon. Um, yeah. And that is a great looking animal. Well, the, 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 yeah, she's actually very yellow. Um, probably isn't showing up on the video camera that's that well. not too bad with the contrast of the white glove. Yeah, yeah. That's... Is that some black gloves? Maybe black gloves look better. <laughs> Look at black gloves on. Nah. I don't think that's going to be a difference, Dude. man. You can't buy gloves right now. Don't do this to them. You don't wear gloves during a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But yeah, yeah she'll be a lot more yellow. So basically, even what you're seeing, even though it's not the full range, what you're seeing is she's going to probably it's like increase by, I'd say, about triple this by the time she's uh, an adult. Wow. And um, yeah. And the, the, can, so I still can, have to. Can, can you give the public scale. what they want and show one that's got a little more age on it? Get some of that more dense coloration in the scales? I don't have any here, man. They're on the other side of the building. I think I might have one, maybe. But most of the ones are at my other place currently. We can wait. Oh, that's fine. That's it's fine. Really We're just going to go ahead and call the interview now when it's yeah. at an all-time low. <laughs> uh, can you can you tell everybody how much one of those is worth? Um. Well, it varies. Um, a really high quality lemon ghost. Here's the thing: I've seen people sell lemon ghosts for like two hundred dollars, and you know they might be okay, they might be nice, but they're they're out crosses. They're not full lemon ghosts. Um, like a really, really high quality lemon ghost that's like neon yellow from like my best lineage. So like once from like, you know, my products I've been line breeding for like, you know, basically 20 years. Um, those nice ones are going to be more around like $700 to a thousand dollars. Okay. And when you're talking about the more rare hognose stuff, like the art, the super Arctic and uh, leucistic, like what's the top end of the hognose market? Well, uh, right now it'd be like leucistics. Um, they're sitting around like seven, eight grand right now. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah hog nose. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Super Arctics. I mean, the Super Arctics has been out for a little while. I started releasing my first ones around like 2014. And um, the Arctics, I wasn't selling Super Arctics right away. Um, but Super Arctics, when I first started releasing them, I think I was putting them around like five, six, seven grand in that range. If they're like, I released like one yearling male and I had them at like 7,500. And then I had like baby females for around like, Five grand, fifty five hundred, and somewhere around like six grand. I can't remember exactly for some reason, but now like a regular Super Arctic. I mean, they held the price really well. I mean, it's a really striking trait. Um, it's extremely cool. It's going to look good in any combination of any um, you know hognose morph. So it's one of the most important hognose genes to have, in my opinion. And a regular Super Arctic still goes for around nine hundred to a thousand dollars. You know, as a baby. Not um, bad. Yeah. Nice. Uh, so um, now, just because the wow factor, um, when the leucistic hognose first became available, um, some of the early buyers, what did they put into that project? Um, before they were confiscated, like like way back then, if you're talking about those, those were like ten grand each. And then even when they were released, um, um, just more recently from the uh, people that bought the collections from the zoos and were breeding them, um, some of those guys were offering like kind of like. It wasn't like a full release where it's like, okay, we're doing a full public release. We got like 10 or 20 for sale. They're like, oh, I'll sell one or two. And they were asking like 15, 20 grand for those. So, I mean, you could have bought a leucistic like four years ago, probably, if you nagged the right person long enough and you had like 20,000 bucks. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Some of the markets and, you know, just the fluctuation over the years and, um, 
you know, we discussed this pink market 10 years ago compared to the market now. And I was even talking to somebody about gargoyle geckos the other day. And they were talking about some of the red lineage gargoyles that are selling for like $2,500 nowadays. And wow. God, I remember gargoyle geckos being next to nothing. And I know they've kind of come a long way, but, you know, you just never really know a certain species when they're going to really peak, I guess you could say. Yep. Well, gargoyles, yeah, gargoyles were uh, really expensive when they first uh, came out. And then when people started line breeding and having the really red ones, um, they went up in value. And I want to say even when I was in my, my late teens, they were expensive. Like really red ones were like six, seven hundred bucks. They were popular. They were actually not cheap at all. And then like David said, then they kind of took a downturn. Then around like 2010, I remember selling or seeing people selling babies for like 30 bucks each. Like just sort of like regular reticulated, you know, pattern, like, you know, gargoyles and just like, like kind of like typical looking gargoyles or like low, like red striped ones for like 30, 40, 50 bucks. And they were actually fairly cheap for a little while. And even the really high red ones and the real nice uh, red and white, red, black, like particularly ones kind of fell in popularity. I don't know what the real nice ones fell down to. They were always kind of a little more expensive, but the popularity was kind of definitely on the downturn. And then in the last three, four years, it's really picked up again. Because um, yeah. like four years ago, I was able to get decent sized gargoyles, uh, nice reticulated, some nice like low grade red stripe ones for like 75 each, you know, like three, five, six months old animals wholesale. If I need, like somebody was like, Hey, I need an export. Uh, can you find, help me find gargoyles? Sure. Um, but now I'm like, if anybody's like, can you help me find gargoyles? I'm like, no, I don't even want to even ask. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Like I see the people, the prices people are paying. It's like insane. And I did a shipment actually for somebody uh, a year ago, a little over a year ago. And they were, they bought a bunch of gargoyles and they're like, we're going to have them include them in your export. And I'm like, sure. And um, there was some like crazy red ones. And yeah, they were like 800 to 1500 each and, you know, white and red, you know, awesome stripes. And many things are good looking. And it's really cool to see people are appreciating, um, you know, all the time and effort that they're putting into line breeding and getting those colors out of them once again. The markets are oh, really yeah. cyclical. Yeah. Like you, yeah. even with skinks, like you could buy them for like 50 bucks a piece. And then it was like up, down, up, down. Now it's up again. Maybe it's a little bit down. Who knows? But <laughs> Yeah, there's it's, usually there's what you're about. Yeah, it's 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 like well, it's kind of like when you look at like blue tongue skinks and you look at the size of them, um, what it takes to breed one, now uh, the amount of babies they're having, and it's like yeah, when people are selling for like seventy five and hundred dollars each, it's like you know that's a species that should be going for more than that, but the interest wasn't quite there uh, on the scale, you know, the demand wasn't quite strong enough. And now it's, the demand's finally caught up to the, you know, logical, you know, point where it should be. Kind of with like hognose snakes too. Because when hognose snakes were being produced a little more um, and they weren't as mainstream in the hobby, you know, you'd sometimes be able to find a Western hognose for 45 and 50 bucks and 60 bucks. And um, I saw every now and then I'll get people that will complain like, oh, these things used to be like 50, 60 bucks. I'm like, yeah, but when you're selling for 50 and 60 bucks, that person really isn't getting paid much for their time or effort um, and energy that they're putting into that animal. And even though they're doing it as a hobby and income might not be, you know, the sole purpose, especially for me when I first started bringing hognose, income was like not even in my mind, actually. Um, when I first started with all this stuff, I was kind of under the impression back then you could not do this for a living. And I was actually told by a bunch of people that you cannot do this for a living. And um, that didn't really dissuade me because I didn't really care. And I was like, I would kind of thought, well, maybe I will be able to use hog as a supplement income. You know, if I produce enough of them, selling for like fifty dollars, you know, each and everything. But with inflation and everything, and then the interest in hogs going up, you know, things kind of leveled off more now. Uh, kind of more, um, it's a little more uh, reasonable for the time and effort you put into them, in, in reflection to the price of the animal. Because like normal hog is now around like a hundred dollars, and what it takes to breed a hog nose, raise them up, and you know. And all the time and effort and food you're putting into them, that's probably where it should be, where, you, you know, the person's getting paid a reasonable amount for their time and effort and energy. And, you know, not all of your effort and energy is in that, too. I mean, it's like talking like customer relations, too. I mean, I'm spending hours a day, you know, talking to people and, you know, helping people, whether they bought from me or didn't buy from me, um, you know, with, with questions that they may have. I agree with all that. <laughs> yep. Okay, we peaked. That's it. All right. We're is, yeah, is it my turn? Oh yeah, you my go one right last, ahead, man. Close it out. All right, well, my what? My one last thing. Maybe if you can just say like, all right. So Dave gave me a little insight, and I just a side note. Let's just point out, Dave, your shirt is like 
neon bright right now, the way that it looks, it's awesome looking. You're like, yeah. you look like you're going to an 80s disco. It's great. Yeah, anything to take the focus off of this is really what I'm going for. <laughs> um, all right. So, Jeff, I heard that you're a big prankster. Yeah. Uh, you love pranks. So can, yeah. you, can you tell us, like, maybe one or two stories uh, of some really memorable prank pranks that you've done? <laughs> yeah. D -d -d yeah. We already know where Dave knows that this one's gone. One of the <laughs> most memorable prank was uh, Dave was doing a reptile show, and he came and picked up some animals. To, uh, from me as well to uh, uh, sell and commission and everything. And um, he left us. He's like, I need more room. I was like, well, you can take my, you know, SUV and um, leave your car here. He was like, okay. And so he left his car there. And, um, you know, I was like, you know, it'd be funny. And even though it's not funny, I'm going to tell Dave I got into a bad car wreck with his car. But because he had the keys, I was like, I'm not going to drive him crazy. Take it, man. I don't care. And I think he even said, so joke something. He goes, you crash it. I don't care, man. It doesn't matter. He goes, you know, Dave's very easy going. And, you know, so I looked up pictures of his make and model and for car crashes. And I came across, um, fortunately, the best possible one. It was like the most bizarre looking accident. It was from like a semi tire flew off or another car tire from an oncoming lane. And it hit this guy's hood and windshield and kind of like smushed it like almost like a hot dog bun in the center. <laughs> and it blew out the windshield and, you know, it skipped off the car. And so I was like, I messaged Dave, like, hey, man, as I took your car out, but I, I had a little bit of a fender bender with it. Um, I was like, the car's drivable. I was like, but they're coming to get on a flatbed and tow it. I was like, it's kind of messed up. And so I cropped out just underneath the uh, license plate, which should have been a little suspicious. And I think Dave was a little suspicious, but he kind of just like, you know, I so I took a picture of it. And I was like, yeah, I was on a highway, like just out like, you know, five miles from my house, dude. And Dave goes, holy shit, man. He goes, how are you alive? I was like, well, you know, you know, hit at this angle and everything. And actually, I read up the story. The person that got in an accident, they actually had a passenger, and the passenger just got glass thrown in their arm, and they said they, you know, had to go to the hospital. But other than that, there was like no injuries. They just had minor glass shards sprayed in their arm. And um, so it was a very survivable crash because both passenger and driver survived. They did a lot of research for this. Yeah. <laughs> and so I told Dave, so I told Dave, I was like, yeah, I just drove it back to my house and everything. And uh, Dave was like, oh, fuck, man. And he's like, that's my wife's car and everything. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> dude. And I kind of wanted to keep the prank going. And so I just didn't break it to him. And then Dave was like, man, I'm going to have to call and tell my wife. And I'm like, oh, shoot. Because I was about to tell Dave then that, I'm like, hey, man, I'm joking. And then uh, the person with Tim Kupanoff was like, here he goes, don't even tell her, Dave. And Dave's like, yeah, I won't tell her until I get back. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. I keep this prank going until <laughs> Dave gets back there. And then Dave messaged me. He goes, hey, can I get a police report? Because you said you did a police report. And I'm like, oh, shit. And so to keep the prank going, so I Googled a police report. And they have, <laughs> they have a police report, but it says copy only across it and everything. And so I was like, you know what? The copy across it is kind of like um, – uh, vague, and I was like, when well, somebody's reading the report, if I send it to them, they're probably not going to pay attention to that and think it's an actual copy. So I printed that out, and I filled it out as best as I could, and um, I sent that to Dave. I was like, here's the police report. And um, and then actually, they, 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 I got kind of yelled at for that, because Dave's like, he goes, man, he goes, and I was like, well, it wasn't my fault, Dave. I was like, you asked for the police report. I was like, that was not part of the prank until you asked for it. I was like, I wasn't <laughs> even going to do that. And so he sent that to his wife, and I guess I was back at home taking care of snakes, not thinking anything of it. Here, his wife's having a crisis, and or you know, his wife at the time and everything um, was having a crisis over calling their insurance agency and giving them <laughs> the details from this police report that I made up. Oh, and uh, she called me up, and she was all, and I thought, I was like, "Oh, it's a prank," and she was really livid. She was <laughs> extremely angry. Wanted to kill me. Dave was kind of thought it was funny and he wasn't too upset because he wasn't in much trouble. It was, I was really the person that was. <laughs> um, and yeah, that, it was uh, pretty bad. And then Dave retaliated pretty good. He, um, it was like good. Cause he didn't, he didn't like strike immediately. And so it was like about a year later, um, go to Tinley and everything. And I go up to a Dave somehow convinced them. It was just kind of scary to give him my, my card key to get up to my room and he hit everything in my room. Um, and when I went back up there, I was like, all my shit's gone. And then even Andrew, my friend, stuff is valuable. My stuff's gone too. Wow. And I'm like, what the fuck? And I was like, my bed was like clean and everything. And I was like, I was like, somebody stole all my shit. 
Dave said he wanted to make it look like they cleaned the room and just removed all my stuff. <laughs> Actually, I thought somebody went in there and just stole my shit. And so I was getting pretty pissed and, um, you know, swearing and, like, you know, getting mad at Andrews. Like, he goes, man, he goes, you're getting too pissed off. I'm like, no, this is fucking stupid. And so then um, my friend Corey was in there. He goes, well, did you check the cabinets? I was like, why would anybody check the cabinets, you idiot? I was like, oh. I was like, I was like my shit's gone. Why would it be in there? So Corey opens the cabinets and all my stuff's in there. And so I'm like, oh. It is in there. And, then I get a four pack of Red Bull, and I'm like, oh, that's Dave's stuff. Because he's always mixing Red Bulls with his, with his drinks. So then I knew Dave was behind it. <laughs> yeah, so things he left out, though. Um, so with um, Jackie, the ex-wife, um, so she cried. And not like a little <laughs> bit. She cried a lot. She yeah. really, really loved this car. And then on top of that, she did call the insurance company about this. And on the policy... Objects flying off of other cars and hitting your car was not covered in the policy. <laughs> so at that point, she thought the car was gone forever and didn't have a car anymore and wasn't going to get covered. Wow. And there might have been more crying because of that. So he really <laughs> broke her brain that day, like really fucked her up. Um, yeah. Well, on my side, I didn't even know that she was being informed of all of this. But uh, the one thing that I would point out, this is a really big positive and a takeaway. You found out on your insurance coverage that flying objects weren't covered. And actually, <laughs> there's a lot of things that can fly off of other cars. So that kind of puts it in perspective like, all right, now you know maybe you should go with different insurance. He was helping you out <laughs> for sure. It was the low yeah, I got you, man. <laughs> Thank you again. It was You're good. Welcome. There's been some other ones over the years. But, yeah, those were two really solid pranks now that I remember. Those that was a good, good prank um, because it's like it wasn't supposed to be me spirited. I guess it kind of ended up in that way on Jackie's end. Unfortunately, <laughs> that was kind of just like severe collateral damage that wasn't foreseeable. Um, it's the reason she's the ex-wife. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that was my you. fault. It, it wasn't the car accident. <laughs> That's actually the from, false car accident. accident. I understand more of that because I know Dave on a personal level. It was like a lot of the driving force is actually his mustache and his uh, reluctancy to cut it was actually, I know, it was, uh, maybe a little bit of a reason. Was that any reason, Dave? I mean, it definitely came up. Um, she definitely hated the mustache. Um, but, you know, and I kind of said this too, and I do feel bad still, but if she couldn't handle that, there was a lot more that she wouldn't be able to handle. So, you know, it is what it is. But, um, yeah, no, the pranks. So um, Benjamin might want to start doing some pranks, and I said maybe we could bring you on as our full-time prankster. Yeah. I have some pretty good ideas. Um, there's one that I like to do. Hey, um, hey, hey, hey. You don't talk about your pranks <laughs> ahead of time. <laughs> I, was about to say, I don't want to say, but it's a pretty good one. It's a pretty decent yeah, one. Yeah, only two episodes good. in, but there's a chance that person might be listening. So. Yeah. So I think yeah. I think it'd be Wait. fun to have you on. Is it me? <laughs> I think it'd be fun to have you on like, oh, and now we're going to call in jeff real quick and update us on this prank and then you'll like do the prank or whatever explain the prank of what happened and uh it would have to be to somebody that you know maybe us and dave or you and dave can discuss of now junior with the weather it. now junior with the weather but really it's with the <laughs> yeah. prank and <laughs> yeah we we the prank really high for you though but if there's no tears you failed <laughs> i don't know i don't know if that's the main objective of most <laughs> you go no, that see you do, like, you do like to carry them pretty far, though, because you don't want to, like, you know, immediately, you know, like, because that's, I'd watch some pranksters on YouTube, and I'm like, that person had a pretty good, um, um, you know, idea, and, but the execution was like, they folded too quickly. It's like, so many mm -hmm. people get, like, the police involved, and it's like, as long as it's not, you're getting arrested right away, and it's not going to implicate you further, you should probably keep it as long going as possible, <laughs> if you get a bad reaction from a police officer, because right. the thing you're looking for is a, is a reaction and everything. Yeah. So you kind of have to like not care. Um, and that's one thing I'm kind of glad I got away from doing prank still a little bit because um, some of the stuff I was kind of doing was like, you know, you could actually get you in trouble even though it's just a total prank and you have all the evidence you could actually get like, because one of my favorite pranks I seen was these guys. It was awesome. They bought an old ATM machine and they filled it with fake money <laughs> and they put it on the side of the street and they'd pull up in a black SUV and masks with like baseball bats and stuff, break into their own ATM and be taking fake money out of it in front of a bunch of people. And the reaction they're getting, and it was so much funnier, it wasn't almost such the people, just the whole act, like these guys bought their own ATM machine, filled it with fake cash, are going up there and like, you know, very believably smashing into it, have bags, pulling all the money out. Then one, they had a chain where they wrapped it around it and dragged it off and then they had people around. You know, some people were, some people would scream and run. 
some people. One guy was like calling the police and like trying to follow them. Um, and then like somebody, like you know, a couple people, like after they took off, it's dark out. They couldn't tell that it was fake money, and then they're taking money themselves too. <laughs> and so that's a very successful prank. But I'm like, man, that's awesome. But then they get dragged into court over it and everything. I'm like, yeah, that's scary. I don't want to be involved in that kind of stuff. So I got some prank ideas where it's like. This would be a lot of fun to do. It'd be really cool, but you know, it can end up with you getting, you know, arrested and then having to explain yourself. And the cops at that time, even though I assume most of these, well, cops are people too. Most of them probably find these pranks pretty damn funny. But when they're on duty, they gotta pretend like, hey, this isn't funny because you know we're being called out for it and everything. But I have seen pranks where there are cops and they react, and you get some cops where they react and they're like, hey, that's not funny at all. And then other ones are like, hey, that is funny. And it's like. Yeah, it's a good um, way to measure, too. <laughs> Typically, if a cop says it's not funny, it probably is. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to ruin a long-term really prank good. right now, but you know what you should do? You should sell these two guys some fake hats, and then in three years when they don't produce, you can be like, <laughs> gotcha, bitch. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> sell them some fake what? Fake hats. Oh, that's not a prank. Oh, I know a big breeder that's responsible for many of those pranks. So I guess you we don't use those names on here, though. Positivity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, those are not fun pranks. So I've been on the uh, other end of those. Um, yeah. Yeah. Those aren't fun pranks. I was like, hey, there goes $4,000. That took me six months to raise when I was 15 years old. And it took me seven years to figure out that all those hats and pos hats and buying more hats from the same person bring them together and getting. Nothing out of them. I'm like, man, that was fun. That sounds like a great prank. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, like, that's the best prank in the hobby. <laughs> it is. Good learning experience. It's a pretty, good, pretty solid prank, I guess. Pretty solid prank. So yeah, <laughs> so yeah, I, I think that this is a, I think this is a great, uh, a great plan. You know, I think uh, having you on as a regular, you know, would be cool. Um, so yeah, I mean. I think, you know, we've been going on for a little while here and uh, two and a half hours or so, a little, little less. But um, I don't know. There should be some closing comments. Closing comments? Um, well, thank you guys for having me on. And thanks, Dave, too. Um, really appreciated all of it. And uh, um, it'd be cool, too, to get some, like, maybe insight if anybody's listening, if they have any other questions I didn't cover with Hognose or any concerns like that, because um, I'd like to – Although this is the podcast, um, I don't know if you guys ever do follow-ups or anything like that. Absolutely. But yeah, coming off cool. a little desperate, buddy. Firm, maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Please have me on again. Nobody else will. I want to be on. I've been <laughs> drinking. All right, what do you want from me? <laughs> yeah, no. I think I think you covered everything. Hog knows um, that won't be necessary. All right. Yeah. <laughs> no, we'll have you. <laughs> if you could, if you could change the battery in your uh, smoke detector, maybe we'll have you on. I don't know. That's yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How much wear your hat next time? Yeah, I'm never really aware when I do go. As soon as it, uh, it's gonna, it's a uh, bad timing. But as soon as this is over, I'm going in there. and I'm taking the damn battery out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then, are you gonna put one in? Not right away. <laughs> <laughs> the other, the other smoke alarms, they're all that's important. Again, the incubator room is not up and running yet. There's no. <laughs> And you'll no, never guess where it's at. There's no chance of a fire, Dave, unless somebody commits arson in that one specific area. And I'm going to gamble that nobody's going to launch any, you know, fiery assaults on my place in that specific area. That, those are a terrible, uh, terrible prank. The, the yeah, it'd be a terrible prank, but it would be one nevertheless. <laughs> it would be. <laughs> uh, All right. I enjoyed it. Um, I thought that was great. Um, thank you again, Junior, honestly. Um, yeah, you know, really yeah, yeah, yeah. here, man. I know there's a lot of conversations we've had before, but um, I never get bored of listening to you talk. So, yeah, yeah, likewise. Yeah, it's too bad. Like, uh, you guys should have a Tiger King um episode. Just get a bunch of people and talk about Tiger King. <laughs> yeah, we should. We could, but by the time we do another episode, it might not even be popular anymore. <laughs> oh, we're doing the releasing some more episodes this weekend. One yeah. more. One more on Easter, so that's pretty exciting, actually. I hope it doesn't suck. It could ruin the entire series if it's a bad episode. That's what I'm hoping they don't do because, yeah, because that was a compilation of, like, five years of material and bits and pieces of it. I mean, you know that they probably only use 20% or 10% of their actual footage. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot more, so it makes sense that they have enough footage saved um, to go back. And probably they probably had things they left out because they probably didn't think it was going to be as popular. 
Um, and then they have some probably re recent interviews too that they're going to involve. But yeah, hopefully they 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 don't ruin it too much. But um, I don't think they really can. Um, as long as they're just doing interviews with people, because it kind of is a documentary, even though it might be slightly sensationalized and they might be portraying certain things or just focusing on certain things. I mean, it is just kind of people talking. I mean, aside from anybody say lying, it's all truthful material. And it's interesting like because that. yeah, sure. there's a lot of aspects to it. Um, you know, exotic uh, part of an animal industry, and then also you know, multiple and uh, uh, accusations of murder and possible like hiring for murder. So yeah, it's a there's a little bit for anybody to enjoy in it. Yeah, Have I, you guys done the um, Carol Bass skit um, number neighbor thing yet? Where you text your number neighbor asking if they think that Carol Bass did it or not? We have <laughs> not. Yeah, I did it. No, They didn't text me back. Um, <laughs> maybe I should have did some small talk first, but yeah, I got no love for my number neighbors. <laughs> I mean, I've seen, I've seen a with a picture of your face? like You know what? When I get wrong numbers, I do that. <laughs> but not when it's intentional. <laughs> that's uh, you you know like i think if we did uh one of those episodes even if uh you know it's a little ways down the line i i mean i i saw tigers is timeless let's just be honest i we saw could i mean we could probably edit that in here somewhere <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean junior's got the face for it <laughs> Go out to Fu Manchu, you're good to go. Yeah, you Fu Manchu before. <laughs> kind of. I think I'm a little lost as to what's going on. <laughs> well, <laughs> we're just saying that you look a lot like David Spade. Oh, okay. Maybe vaguely. We're both white guys that are skinny. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's it. <laughs> and that's a perfect place to close. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, Ryan, you want to take us out? Thank you so much, man, for spending some time with us tonight. It was an awesome conversation. No stroking egos. You are the king of Boland's Pythons, and I appreciate your insight. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> if you like this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below. Any questions you have for this guy, we'll make sure he uh, answers you right quick, especially if you get him by from him. He loves it. And, uh, you know, catch us next time, man. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Dave, you can say the catchphrase and we'll get out of here. We have a new catchphrase? Is that we're it? Is that we're it? We're waiting to hear it. We're waiting to, we thought you were going to make it up. On the spot, just like yeah, that? You yeah. think I'm that good? Yeah. I um, I might not have anything. Zing zong, zoobity boo. I must ask you a question. <laughs> oh, that's like the worst one ever. That's so obvious. Yeah, it's not a good yeah. one. Yeah, oh, I'll yes. be honest. Um, yeah. Usually I'm good with this kind of stuff, but you really fucked me over there. Um, really <laughs> fucked me over. I, I got nothing. So, uh, yeah, thanks. That was a, that was a yeah. bad prank. Sorry. I'm going to spend all week working on that catchphrase. <laughs> like, yeah, thanks. Uh, we'll, we'll have to be more professional, you know, for our next people, you know. That's, that's Preferably. Our yeah. Preferably. I apologize. But, um, all right. So, thank you so much. And, uh, yeah, so we'll see you guys uh, later. And thank you guys for watching. Peace out, guys.